Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Cryosphere Pavilion for a rather special day for us. Uh, today, we released the uh, Cryosphere 1.5 report, and we'll be going through the results and main messages of that report throughout the day. This is a summary briefing of the report. Um, its main message is that because of cryosphere dynamics, many of them irreversible, uh, a 1.5 degree limit really is an unavoidable conclusion, and I'll be going through some of the science behind that. The report was authored and reviewed by over 40 scientists, cryosphere scientists, many of them IPCC authors on either the special report on 1.5 degrees or the special report on oceans and cryosphere. Others were involved in the fifth IPCC assessment or are working currently on the sixth assessment. The other thing that we chose to do with this report is to include new science that uh, will feed into the sixth assessment report. Cryosphere science is very rapidly evolving. And uh, because of that, we chose to include some of those as well, especially on issues such as permafrost and sea ice, as you'll see. Um, these are the kinds of thresholds that we talk about. And you can see down at the bottom where we are today at 1.1 degrees and where um, RCP 4.5, which is an uh, emissions run that would lead us to about 2.4 degrees by 2100. And we're using that as a proxy for the two degree goal in this report because um, a lot of the debate, I'd say right now, at least theoretically, among parties to the convention is, is it worth it going for 1.5 or is two degrees enough? And of course, right now we're headed to about somewhere between 2.9 and 3.2 degrees in 2100 instead. And as you can see, by two degrees, virtually all of these dynamics, uh, with the possible exception of the ice sheets of East Antarctica, are engaged, are happening. Um, and one of the earliest, actually, as you see from here, permafrost thaw has been going on for quite some time. But the West Antarctic ice sheet, as you'll hear a little bit later, probably tipped sometime before 2015. The issue there is trying to slow down the sea level rise from that ice sheet. Um, beginning with the glaciers, uh, tropical glaciers will simply disappear at today's uh, level of temperature. Those cannot be saved. So these are the glaciers of the Northern Andes, East Africa, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. There are actually some small glaciers there. There may be a few that can survive even at one degree that are at very high altitude, say over 6,000 meters. But basically, we've lost those entirely, no matter what we do at this point. The mid-latitude glaciers, though, are a different story. And there, you can preserve substantial remnants of glaciers at 1.5 degrees. And probably the most striking example is the Alps. That's the lower right, Central Europe, it's called. But it's essentially the Alps. And these uh, may even show a bit of regrowth. So the blue line is a 1.5 degree limit. Um, and the yellow line is closer to um, two degrees. Again, under high emission scenarios, though, you can see that all of these mid-latitude glacier systems, so more the southern Andes, the Rockies in Canada and the US, Scandinavia, New Zealand, Caucasus, um, all of those would disappear actually almost by the end of the century. Um, but preserve quite a bit more ice if we can stay below 1.5 degrees. And then what we call the high latitude glaciers, which are mostly Arctic glaciers and some Antarctic glaciers uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, and high altitude glaciers, in other words, the Himalayas. You can really reduce the loss at 1.5 degrees, but even at 1.5, these glaciers, which are so important for water supply to the region, will lose about a third of their mass. At two degrees, they'll lose about half. If we get to four degrees, they're going to lose two thirds. And that's at the same time, of course, as these uh, countries are under water stress because of things like uh, perturbations in the monsoon system that makes it much more difficult to predict how much water is going to be there. In polar oceans, this is a really important impact, and we're seeing the impacts already today at one degree. There is, There are some signs of shell damage, especially in the Arctic Ocean, but uh, even 1.5 degrees is probably going to see quite a bit of um, acidification. 
And at the same time, these oceans are freshening uh, because of the melt of glaciers and ice sheets, and they're warming. And you're getting stress on these species from uh, other species that are migrating from the lower latitudes into now warmer waters. And so what's going to happen to this ecosystem is uh, very unclear in terms of how quickly it will happen, but at two degrees, uh, you're going to see quite a bit of acidification. And the way this has been put by some of the marine biologists I've spoken to, you can think of these species being pressed down because of acidification from the north, because the colder waters uh, acidify much more quickly. They're being pressed from below by uh, warmer waters and by new species migrating in and competing, and eventually there's going to be no room for them. And so that's going to be a real extreme impact. And acidification takes about 50 to 70,000 years to buffer out. So this is a truly irreversible impact from CO2, and it can only be uh, held back by lower C2 emissions. Permafrost is something that we've learned a lot about just in the past year. And losses to date are fairly extreme, uh, but the losses will become even greater because of these abrupt thaw processes that have been observed now that will about double the amount of uh, warming from the CO2 and methane that is released from per permafrost in the near term because these abrupt thaw processes occur under wet conditions. That means more methane is released, and so the warming is much more uh, intense and faster. And so that leads into a feedback where you get more permafrost disappearing. Um, sea ice loss, uh, I think most people are aware of the loss of Arctic sea ice and close, really tracks closely with CO2 emissions, but um, one of the things that has been difficult with sea ice is that the global models have always lagged behind how much sea ice has actually disappeared. And if you calibrate those models with what we're actually seeing. The conclusion is that um, we're going to be seeing an ice-free period in the Arctic Ocean already around 1.7 degrees. We may even see an occasional ice-free summer at 1.5 degrees, but by two degrees that ice-free period is going to last for several months, most years, perhaps from July to October. And that's going to have a lot of feedbacks on a warming Arctic because you have dark water, uh, warming ice sheet on Greenland, and uh, especially thawing permafrost. So this is a true um, cascading effect. But as important as having even th thin sea ice is the fact that the old thick ice is disappearing. And in this animation, you can see beginning in about 1990, the extreme decline in thick multi-year ice, uh, more than four meters thick. If you look at the uh, graph up to the left, you can see the amount of sea ice over four years old just dropping. See, in 2007, there was that extreme loss event. And as we reach 2019, you'll see that there is almost nothing left uh, of this multi-year ice. It's, it's down to essentially zero. And this sea ice is important because it's its own ecosystem. There's been a lot of talk about coral reefs at this blue cop, but the thick multi-year ice is sort of the equivalent of the coral reefs in the Arctic. Uh, a lot of species grow there and live there, and the ecosystem depends on having that multi-year ice, at least some remnant. Um, and if it's all gone, again, that ecosystem is anticipated to collapse. And finally, going into uh, ice sheet loss, this is what is anticipated in terms of annual flooding, but 100-year flood events in Tianjin near Beijing, and this is by 2050. And uh, in Bangladesh and uh, Kolkata, again, this is by 2050 under all emission scenarios. So even at one degree, we're going to be seeing an awful lot of flooding. But because of the d special dynamics of the West Antarctic ice sheet, it probably reached a level of instability already sometime bef before 2015, around you know, 0.8 degrees is the sense. That holds about three to four meters of sea level rise. Um, we probably can't stop that from happening, but we can make the time for collapse stretch out over centuries or even thousands of years. But if we go to higher temperatures, that collapse can occur relatively quickly. And that, again, is another reason to stay below 1.5 degrees. And in this report, we've looked quite a bit to Earth's past um, because, again, a lot 
of the focus here is what is the limit, what is the Earth's new stable temperature? And what the Earth's past says to us is that in the past, even at one degrees, around one to 1.5, we actually had an Earth that had six to nine meters of sea level rise. It might have taken a very long time to occur, but if we are satisfied with that as a stable temperature, then we have to say that we're satisfied with six to nine meters of sea level rise. Once you start getting closer to two degrees, you're somewhere between six and 13 meters, which means that you've got contributions from land glaciers and at least substantial parts of one ice sheet and maybe from both. But in the period between two to three degrees, that temperature range, uh, which we were last at uh, over three million years ago, uh, sea levels ranged from 12 and maybe up to 25 degrees at the end. This is work by Andrea Dutton, who actually just got a MacArthur Genius Fellowship for the work that she's done. And uh, her most recent paper released this year is focusing more on that 25 meter level. So we can't see staying above two degrees as anything safe at all. And you'll hear more about this later. But the good news again is that this can really be affected by policy um, and we need to take the long view. So the, the smaller graph is only going through 2100, which is mostly what you see. But as you go through 2500, uh, you're looking at levels of 15 meters. Uh, but you have this role for policy between a 1.5 degree low emission scenario and a high emission scenario that can really constrain this. At a minimum, slow it down, and certainly the scale of sea level rise will be a lot less. So there's a lot more detail in the report itself. Uh, you see the, the URL here. It's available online. Um, and again, I think the inevitable conclusion that, that cryosphere scientists stay awake at night worrying about is that even one degree actually is not that safe, especially when it comes to things like sea level rise. Uh, so even with a 1.5 limit, we really need to aim to returning to one degree as soon as possible. So um, thank you very much. Happy to take questions or just come back you know, throughout the day. Yeah, um, I can send that to you because we save those as PDFs because the files are too large. But if you're interested, I can send you a link to it. Yeah, yeah. This is the, this was for those online. This was about the uh, disappearing multi-year ice. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, please come back uh, at 10 a.m. Central Time, and uh, we'll have a very special presentation on mountain glaciers. Uh, and will be introduced by the Swiss Deputy Minister of Environment. This is getting into the end game here at the COP. He is probably negotiating, but uh, we're hopeful that he'll be here. Thank you very much. You think the quality's okay? Yes. All right. Yeah. Because I'd like to be able to show that movie.
Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started here in the pavilion. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today at the Cryosphere Pavilion. And for those who are online, good morning. Thank you for being here. Today is a special day here at the Cryosphere Pavilion. We are so happy to release a new report, which is called the Cryosphere 1.5 report. And throughout the day, we're going to have talks by scientists talking about the different sectors of the cryosphere. This report, you can find it online. It is already available. You can find it on iccinet.org slash cryosphere15, in one word, cryosphere15. So for opening remarks this morning, we are very honored to welcome Marc Chardonnan. He's the State Secretary and Director of the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment. Thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thank you very much also for the invitation. I am also very honored to be here because I think it's one of the key issues that we have to face in the next decades or next uh, century. And uh, it will, oh, I must pay attention that I don't make the, pre the presentation run parallel. We have parallel sessions. <laughs> okay, uh, let me first uh, say the following. The Chairman uh, Cup Presidency had made the cryosphere one of its priorities. The cryosphere pavilion is an expression of this priority. The International Cryosphere Climate Initiative and its director Pam Pearson have played a crucial role in this endeavor and I'd like to thank you all and by heart for the, the great job you did. Switzerland worked closely with you throughout the year. Together with you, the Chalon, uh, Chalon uh, Cup Presidency and the other partner countries and organizations, we all had worked tirelessly towards a, a far-reaching cryosphere program in Santiago de Chile. I must commend you that you have been able to adapt and to set up another cryosphere pavilion uh, here in Madrid in such a short time, and a, a very successful pavilion with a lot of contributions. Thank you very much. The cryosphere, on the other hand, cannot easily adapt and is indeed very sensitive to small changes in temperature ice sheets, polar and high mountain glaciers, the snowpack, as well as permafrost are strongly impacted by the ongoing global warming. At the same time, the cryosphere represents a fundamental control mechanism on the physical, biological and social environment, and this across a very large part of the Earth's surface. I was just told before that Almost everybody on the Earth is affected in a way or another way by the cryosphere. The cryosphere uh, crucial role has so far often been overlooked. Also, the state of the cryosphere has an immediate impact on the life and the security of billions of people. Over the past decades, we have already seen major negative impacts on food security, water quality, livelihoods, health and well-being, as well as infrastructure and transportation. And ultimately, we have also seen impacts on the culture of human societies. Just as the Arctic and Antarctica large parts of Switzerland were formed by glaciers and ice. Today, the temperature in the Alps is rising at the same rate as it is at the poles, that is twice as fast as the global average. The latest scientific data 
underline that uh, two, uh, two degrees of global warming, Swiss and all alpine permafrost, permafrost is towing and mountains, including the Matterhorn and Servan, are already crumbling. Glacier and snow ecosystem are in our DNA, in our collective memory, our heritage, in the stories of our past. That is why we perceive ourselves truly as a vertical Arctic nation, nation and with our mountains a part of the third pole. The disappearance of the glaciers, I said it yesterday evening by launching the program of uh, the adaptation on adaptation in climate change adaptation mountains. It's really a cultural shock for our societies. The sensitivity of the cryosphere to global warming is a great worry to us. It's alarming that the cryosphere will undergo irreversible changes if global average, uh, average temperatures rise about 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, while it is a pleasure to be with you today and congratulate ICCI and all the contributing authors on the publication of this excellent cryosphere 1.5 degrees report, its content causes me great worry. Our global community is, as of today, not living up to its responsibility to future generations. And I won't be able to say uh, it better than you do in the preface to the new report. I quote, at some point in the gradient above 1.5 degrees, processes will be set in motion that cannot be halted or easily reversed. In some cases, not even temp if temperatures return to pre-industrial. This is why policy decisions in the coming years will determine the future state of the Earth for centuries and generations to come. Switzerland is ready to act with all of you. It's our livelihood and survival that is at stake. I would like to thank you very much and by heart for all your efforts. I hope we have further opportunity to speak about these evolutions at the next COP26. It's a cryosphere pavilion, the full cryosphere pavilion in Glasgow. Thank you very much and have a very successful day. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your kind words. And we now welcome to the stage Professor Regina Hock. And she will be telling us about the glaciers, especially the chapter that is from the Cryosphere 1.5 report. Regina, thank you. OK, thank you very much. And thank you for all of you for coming. So glaciers, will there be any in 100 years? Yes. But glaciers around the world have lost and will lose substantial ice volume by the end of the century. Many glaciers will disappear, and that has impacts on sea level, stream flow, hazards, landscapes, so it does affect people. And I want to go through these points now in my about 20, 25 um, minute presentation. Um, we heard a lot about ice sheets. There's different sessions about ice sheets. So this one is focused only on the mountain glaciers. So all glaciers in the world outside the ice sheets, but uh, including those in the periphery of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. This is about 200,000 glaciers in the world. They cover 700,000 square kilometers. And what that means is it's the size of Texas or the size of Spain and Great Britain together. The sea level equivalent is about 40 centimeters. So if all these glaciers melted, sea level would rise about 40 centimeters. Overall, these glaciers only make up 1% of all glacier ice on Earth. Antarctica and Greenland are much bigger. But 
their con considerable contributors to sea level rise make up 1% of the world's ice volume, but they contribute to sea level rise more than Antarctica at the moment, and about as much as green, the Greenland ice sheet. So they're con um, considerable, large contributors to sea level rise, and they're often forgotten because people think about the big ice sheets. Glaciers have lost a lot of ice during the last 100, 150 years. Um, a lot of documentation is about the last 50 years here in, in McCall Glacier in Alaska or uh, another glacier in Alaska. And you see, I mean, a substantial retreat here only during the last 50 years. And you can go around the world, wherever you go, you see this retreat. Here in the tropics, Chakotaya Glacier has disappeared in, in the last years, Kilimanjaro or and what is interesting is now we see these glacier changes during the last 50 years, but now we see tremendous changes in just a few years. This is a good example here from Switzerland, 2010 to 2018. I mean, a tremendous change just in a few years. Same here in Findeling Gletscher in Switzerland. Also, just in eight years, a change that is really remarkable. Looking now at all glaciers in the world, what you see here is a compilation from the SROC report about all glaciers in the world aggregated in different glacier regions. And I just want to walk you through what is shown in an example here. So it shows every year how much kilograms per square meter per year are lost that, and, uh, as a mean. That's the black curve here. And the shading is the uncertainty. And a thousand kilograms per square meter means one meter of glacier thinning. That is more intuitive. So in the Central Europe, all the Southern Andes, now in the last years, there's about a meter of thinning per year. Every year, a meter of thinning on average over all glaciers in these regions. Um, the, uh, we compiled also other estimates. Uh, from the GRACE satellite or other that were available, everything that we could find in the literature. And those are shown here as average over a few years, and which period is shown here as the horizontal bar. So we put all those together, and they paint a picture of an increase in mass loss around the world. So two things are sort of striking here. One is there's a lot of interannual variability. You can see it goes up and down, up and down. And that one should not misinterpret. There is years with positive mass balance in some regions. Um, but those are not um, mark, mar masking the general trend. In all the regions, you see a trend towards more mass loss, more thinning per year um, on average in all regions. But we also see huge differences between the regions. Like here in Central Europe or the Southern Andes, there's about a meter of um, uh, thinning every year. Whereas in high mountain Asia, it's actually, there's a trend to more, towards more mass loss, but the, mass, the thinning is actually less because there are some regions where the glaciers are in balance or even growing. But overall, the, the picture in the world is an increased mass loss around the world. The other map in this graph shows now the regionally average glacier mass budgets. And you can express glacier changes in two units. One is the kilograms per square meter, which shows the average thinning, and that's the red bars. So the average thinning is very different in different parts of the world. You can also express um, the thinning, uh, the mass change in sea level rise equivalent, and that's the blue bars. And here you can very clearly see there is regions with large thinning, like the Caucasus, European Alps, and Patagonia. They have the largest thinning rates in the world. But of course, the sea level contributions of like Central Europe or Caucasus is, is not very large. It's, it's, you know, it's negligible. So it really depends where you are, uh, why it matters. In, we have large thinning rates in some regions. Um, we have less thinning, for instance, in Alaska, but because the area is so large, the contribution to sea level is so much. So essentially, the red bars, uh, the blue bars, are the thinning rate times the area. And if you have a lot of area, you don't need much thinning, you still produce a lot of sea level rise. 
So Nobis' question is, of course, why do the glaciers retreat? The main um, variable is temperature. The warmer it is, the more ice melts. Um, this is one of the few studies looking at the anthropogenic impact. It's a modeling study using just natural forcing here in green or using full forcing, natural and anthropogenic. And you see in the last decades, this um, diverges. Whereas in the first part of the century, the last century, there's only about 25%, plus minus 35, so large uncertainty attributed to anthropogenic causes. During the last uh, 40 years or so, 91 to 2010, the anthropogenic component is almost 70%. So, glaciers are losing mass worldwide due to climate change, in particular due to warming. Increases in precipitation occur in some regions, but they generally, by large, do not make up do, uh, the, uh, for the mass losses due to increased temperature. Some glaciers are advancing, but those are the absolute exception. And the advances are often caused by glacier dynamic mechanisms that have nothing to do with climate. They are often portrayed in the, in, in the media. They make it a, a lot often in the press. But they are the absolute exception. This is just a few glaciers in the world out of these 200,000 glaciers that are uh, advancing. So how will the glaciers change in the future? Um, just to remind everybody about the scenarios, um, often the uh, scenarios for the glaciers there we are using the rcp scenarios so the rcp 2.6 is a low emission scenario where the emissions then after 2020 actually decrease and a high submission scenario or 8.5 where they continue to increase and how that, does that translate to temperature 1.5 or 2 degrees you see here for the 2.6 scenario is actually more aggressive than the 1.5, the temperatures rise actually more. And so you see a little bit how that translates to the scenarios. And the 8.5 is, I mean, far more by the end of the century than 1.5 or 2 degrees. And currently, we are on the track of the 8.5. So this is projections of all glaciers in the world. Different glacier models are the different colors. And individual runs with like 10, 20 GCMs are the faded lines. For the low emission scenario, there's about globally, all glaciers in the world, almost 20% of uh, mass loss. For the high emission scenario, about 36% uh, percent of uh, mass loss. So substantial mass losses, but it also shows there's a lot of ice left by the end of the century. That means even beyond 2100, these smaller glaciers compared to the ice sheets will contribute to sea level rise. But this is the global pic picture. Um, yeah, uh, before going to the regional, um, the, these mass changes translate to a cumulative sea level contribution of about um, 9.4 centimeters to about 20 centimeters on average uh, in these simulations um, for, the, for the high emission scenario. So 20 centimeters is quite a lot until the end of the century. And that translates into rates of sea level rise. In the, uh, in the low emission scenario, the rates go down, because not because the glaciers disappear, but the glaciers actually have the chance to find a new equilibrium. They retreat to higher elevation and find a new equilibrium. That means they gain as much mass as they lose. So overall, they don't contribute to sea level rise. Whereas in the eight, uh, RCP 8.5, there's a, con, uh, con, um, a constant increase until the end of the century, because even though the glaciers disappear and retreat, the thinning rates increase so much um, that they, the uh, contribution to sea level rise actually increases. And some simulations show that it's more than 3 millimeters per year. Currently, sea level rises 3.3 millimeters per year. By the end of the century, we might have three millimeters only from the glaciers, not including the ice sheets and everything else. So looking at regions, here you see in the upper left the global and global excluding Antarctica and Greenland. And you see substantial um, decreases in volume. So 
yeah, so you see 100% of the mass now, and then how the mass changes, what remains until the end of the century, and you see substantial differences between the regions. Everywhere decrease, but there's huge differences. In areas where there's a lot of ice right now, um, Arctic Canada, Alaska, the relative um, losses are in the order of 10, 20, 30 percent or so. Um, but for regions with little ice, and that's here like Scandinavia, North Asia, low latitudes, Central Europe, with the higher emission scenario, these regions lose 80 percent or more of their current volume. So essentially, there's a chance that they disappear. But what is encouraging, in a way, is in all our projections, we see differences in the scenarios. For the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, it doesn't matter which scenario you use. You get essentially the same result. But then it diverges. So it does make a, a difference on which pathway we are, and that means also we can, do, we, we, we can influence it. So the higher emission scenario has considerably more mass loss. But the glaciers have a sort of a response time. So even if the climate was not changing anymore, the glaciers will lose mass. But we can, the degree of change, we can influence. So just some examples now from individual glaciers. That's here a simulation of the largest glacier in Europe, Arlich Gletscher in Switzerland, for a middle of the road, the RCP 4.5 scenario. And it looks very, very different by the end of the century. Um, this is the same, but now a high emission scenario and a low emission scenario. In the beginning, not very much difference, but then is a big difference between the high emission scenario and the low emission scenario. So glaciers will disappear, many will disappear, and you can actually see it. There's another example from Switzerland. In just a few years, I mean, look at the difference. Just in 12 years, this glacier has almost disappeared. And now, here the difference only in one year, in one year and a half, this is the difference from 2017 to 2019. So we see tremendous differences now, um, changes in just the last years, especially in these regions where the glaciers are small. And this one here, 40% area loss in just one year. Um, this is a projection of glaciers uh, of a large ice field in Alaska, 3,800 square kilometers, which is about double the ice amount than Switzerland, and then the entire European Alps. So this is just one big ice, um, um, ice cap, ice field. Um, we see losses by the end of the century of 50, 60 percent. But these, this ice field is so high, the, the mountains are so high, that we see large uh, losses but the, some of the glaciers can, I mean, they can retreat to higher regions and can survive. But that is very, very different for ice uh, fields that are at low elevation. Here, Yakutat Glacier is a glacier 600 square kilometers, just one glacier. And even if the climate does not change, we have made projections, it's going to disappear. It's doomed. And that is because the elevation is much lower. There's no chance for this ice field to retreat to higher elevation, like here the Juno ice field. So these are very, very close to each other. So it's not only the climate, it's also the how the glaciers, the physical setting that uh, determines what happens to the glaciers. So Juno ice field, a lot of the ice can still survive. Yakutat ice field, even no climate change, it's going to be gone in, in 2110. And under like climate warming, it's going to be gone in just a few decades. And this is 600 square kilometers of ice. We did an experiment here with the Juno ice field to keep different climates constant. We run a scenario, but then keep the climate, the current climate constant. And we see it stabilizes, uh, stabilizes at 86% of the current volume. If you keep the climate a little bit later constant, it's less volume, but it stabilizes. And if you keep the climate of the end of the century constant, the projected, it's going to be gone. So the main point is here, it, ma it makes it different what climate scenario you use. So if we can stabilize the climate at any of these points, it's a huge difference for this ice field. 
there's not very many projections. So these were projections until the year 3000. So there's not many projections that go beyond 2100. But this is one study is um, already re relatively old from 2012, but there's nothing new that goes also until the year uh, 2300 using different projections for all glaciers in the world. And what you can see is the millimeter sea level rise for the different RCPs. Oh, the middle of the blue should be 4.5. Uh, that's an error. Um, you see not very much difference for the next decades, but then you see a huge difference between the scenarios. And why the sea level um, goes to almost zero then at the end, there's two explanations. One is the glaciers still uh, remain, but um, have reached an equilibrium, and that will happen with RCP 2.6, whereas for the RCPC 8.5, yeah, that's 8.5, the red, um, the glaciers have melted away. So there's a huge difference between the scenarios. So we can really change it um, yeah, by depending what scenario is going to happen. And that's another figure now regionally that was global before for a few regions. And you also see here, for instance, Central Europe. Um, now it's the other way around. When the curves go up, it's mass loss. Volume is lost. But under RCP uh, um, 2.6, which is the red curve, the glaciers are actually gaining again volume um, over the next 100 years. So again, a huge difference, especially regionally, which scenario we follow. So now, why does it matter? What are the impacts of these glacier changes? And I will go through these effects. We, I talked about sea level, but I want to continue with stream flow. Glaciers. Um, there are a source of water in many stream systems. They affect the seasonality. Most of the water comes in summer. That means when the glaciers disappear, they no longer compensate, for instance, for dry summers. So they have this nice compensation effect. Um, they have large diurnal variations because it's melt that determines the runoff. And that poses a risk for floods, especially if it's increased um, or if it's combined with rain. And this is something you see here from data from Fanac Fan and Austria. Um, you see the runoff, the blue curve, during a period in the 70s and 80s when the glacier was in balance. It, only 20 years later, the runoff from the glacier looked like the red curve. The peaks were about 10 times as high than in the 70s. And one of these peaks washed away this research station here, which was built when the glacier, when the runoff looked like the blue curve. So enormous changes only in within like one, two decades when the glacier changes its mass uh, a budget. Also affected is the year to year variability because the glaciers compensate in summer, um, which is nice. And the annual runoff is affected. And that leads me now to the concept of peak water. So what happens to the annual runoff um, when a glacier retreats? The runoff first will go up, and it can be substantial. It can go up 50% or so. But as the glacier retreats even more and becomes smaller and smaller, the runoff from the glacier goes down. And of course, for water resources um, purposes, it's very important when does that happen. Because first it's more water, and then it's less water. So and that's the concept of peak water. So when is peak water reached in the world is an imp in a, a very important question. This is a figure from the Estrog chapter 2 showing peak water. The bars show the results of a modeling study. Every single glacier in the world is modeled. And how much of the area in that region reaches peak water when in 10-year bins. So for the low latitudes, almost all the area has reached already peak water. Whereas, and it's sorted here by peak water. So these regions are which ones um, experience peak water or have already experienced it, and which ones will further in the future. So. What you see is here, the regions with very little ice to begin with, like the low latitudes, Central Europe, Pyrenees, ca Caucasus, they have, much of the catchments have reached peak water already. 
Whereas the more ice you have, like Alaska, Southern Andes, Iceland, reaches peak water much later. So this is very important information if you want to build a power plant close to a glacier. Is the runoff increasing or decreasing? And yeah, and we see really dramatic changes between the regions. And it is a matter of how much ice there is. So this is the results of a study about peak water at High Mountain Asia that will be published next week. Um, here we looked at um, different catchments, different regions in High Mountain Asia. And you can see here these r different river basins. It's the runoff from the glaciers. It's not the total runoff here of the Ganges or Brahmaputra, but just from the glaciers in these catchments. And you see that in some catchments, like the Ganges, Brahmaputra or so, peak water has already been reached. It just goes downhill. It goes like it decreases. And there it doesn't matter which scenario you use. But in some regions, and especially the one in the more interior regions, like the Tarim, um, the, it makes a huge difference which scenario you follow when peak water is reached. And you see an increase in the runoff for many, many decades to come under a high emission scenario. This is here a map of the peak water. Red is, it has been reached already. And, um, or will be reached in very, very few years. And blue is it will be reached much later. And if you really look at a highly spatially differentiated way, like here, you see huge differences. It really depends where you are. And you can see that the muzoon fed rivers, like the Ganges and Par Brahmaputra, they hit peak water before the end of the century. And then the runoff goes down. Whereas the Ristalis fed rivers, they hit peak water much later. So that means a runoff will increase and increase. And that has, of course, implications for agriculture, for hydropower, or for any uh, human uses uh, of the water. And that, whether or not the glaciers matter, depends what's the contribution of the glacier melt water of all the sources of water. You have precipitation, you have snow melt, there's other sources of water. And that's where you see, like here, the Ganges and Brahmaputra, uh, the um, the glacier melt is not very much because peak water has already been reached. But here in the inner Tibetan plateau, glacier melt water is a huge component of the runoff from these um, glacier regions. So, of course, it does not only matter when we have peak water, but also how much is it increasing. Because if it only increases a percent or two, I mean, who cares when you have peak water? But it is, these um, increases are actually substantial. Here you see, um, now at peak water, how much is the runoff higher? How much is the increase? And you see an increase here, the southern parts of this domain. Um, red means not very much increase. But that's simply because it has reached peak water already, or it will reach just in a few years. There's not much time to actually increase. But the, those regions that reach peak water later, the increases can be substantial. There can be like 50, 60, 70, 80% more water in the, um, coming from the glaciers. So it really matters. The next question is, how is this annual increase distributed over the season? Is it um, equally distributed? And it's not. So what you see here, it's a busy figure, but relatively easy to understand. It's blue means an increase in runoff. Red means a decrease. And the size of the circles is proportional how much. And it's done here for the months June to October in the Northern Hemisphere. The first column is by 2050. Uh, the second for each of the months is by 2100. And what we see is actually a sort of a um, globally consistent picture that in June, in all the regions in, in the Northern Hemisphere, there's an increase in runoff. And some of it's substantial, 10, 20, 30 percent. Then in the main summer months, there's a decrease in many of the catchments. And then in October again, an increase in some, a decrease in others. But there's sort of a spatially a consistent pattern that it's, first of all, not distributed equally. It really matters when. And that can be then very, very important if you have months of uh, um, dryness, if you have like months without precipitation and the runoff decreases. So just your seasonally um, 
yeah, Ju July, almost an increase everywhere. August, not much change. September, decrease. And October, it's very different depending where you are. And the next question is, of course, does the glacier run off matter? Because these stream, I mean, these rivers, the Ganges, is huge. If there's a little bit of glacier water co are coming, does it matter? And we could see here, essentially the essence of this figure is, wherever it's dark colors, uh, it matters. Gray means it doesn't matter. We looked at large scale catchments, and the hot spot is here, high mountain Asia. There's, uh, um, there's catchments that are dry, where it, at least in one month of the season, the decrease in water in the big river is about 10, 20% or something like that. So it does matter in, at, at some point during the year. Annually, it doesn't. But in, at some point, uh, time during the year, it matters. So the impacts on stream flow, to summarize, all over the world, we see changes in seasonality, an increase in winter runoff, earlier spring peaks, and we see increases and decreases in summer and annual runoff. That's this concept of peak water. It depends where you are. And there's also effects on quality and properties. Water temperatures will increase when the glaciers retreat. In Alaska, this affects salmon. Fish don't like it if the temperatures change. And it also affects, we see a release of mercury and other legacy contaminants stored in glaciers now that the glaciers retreat. Glacier retreat affects slope instability. This is here an example from Switzerland again. The glacier was thinning, and the mountain slopes became unstable because just the ice doesn't hold it back anymore. Um, we see a number on, uh, of and the size of lakes increasing um, as the glacier retreats. Often lakes form. And one of the most devastating examples is here in Kandanath in India in 2013. 4,000 people died when this lake um, water was released. Um, lakes can only fo also form by, like here's a, a glacier was advancing here hundreds of years ago, and can dam lakes. And those can, yeah, these catastrophic um, um, outbursts can happen when then suddenly the ice can't hold that water back anymore, and it actually drains under the glacier. Um, we saw a glacier collapse very recently in Tibet, and it's not clear how much is that related to climate change because those events are very rare. But essentially, the entire glacier just collapsed, and it was running down seven kilometers into the valley and killing nine people. And the glacier was coming so fast that they, they couldn't flee. So because water is involved in these events, so there's also a chance that this might happen more um, with more melt. Glaciers impact landscapes. From these examples I showed about Switzerland, it doesn't look pretty when the glaciers retreat. They just leave dirt and debris. But also here, Mendenhall Glacier in Alaska is a glacier that is visited by half a million people per year. Uh, Juno has 10,000 people. There's cruise boats coming in. And they go, but the only thing they do, they're a few hours in town, go to the visitor center and look at the, at the glacier. We made projections in 20, 30 years, the glacier is no longer visible from the visitor center. And that might have impact on the cruise ships might not come in anymore. So it has direct economic impacts. It also has impacts on cultural values. Um, the glaciers are among the principal reasons for five sites and 28 sites, the secondary region, for becoming a UNESCO World Heritage Natural Site. And this was here, was a press release from like earlier this year. Almost half the World Heritage Sites could, be, could lose their glaciers by the end of the century. And there's examples of these World Heritage Sites in Argentina, Alaska, Greenland, Swiss Alps, Himalaya, all over the world. It also affects, uh, affects cultural values that people in many areas of the world have a very, they, they just are part of their belief system, part of their intrinsic cultural values. Here, a pilgrimage up to a glacier in Peru, or also in, in, in Nepal, but also in the Italian Alps, there's studies that when the glaciers retreat, it puts, sort of, it puts people into distress because they think it's their fault that the glaciers now retreat, and it's part of their, their culture, their, their heritage, and their belief system. So there are impacts on, on people also that way. And a positive aspect, now that the glaciers retreat, this, uh, it's a heaven for glacier archaeology. There's a lot of um, artifacts melting out, and that's, of course, like, yeah, 
good for glacier archaeologists. So why does it matter? What are the impacts? I hope it became clear that there's more than just stream flow, and I mean, there's many, many impacts that glaciers, they are losing mass rapidly, and this does impact people around the world, everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Hock. Just before we take questions, uh, we have another special guest uh, who is here today this morning with us, and thank you so much for being here. We have Jean-Pascal Van Ypersela. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Jean-Pascal is the IPCC Vice Chair of the Fifth Assessment Report. He's a climate physicist professor at the UCL, at the UC University of Louvain. That's correct. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Thank you. Very Welcome. Well, thank you very much for giving me um, the floor uh, a minute or two. Thank you very much, Regine, for your wonderful uh, talk and for showing so clearly at least three very important uh, facts. Glaciers had a very visible canary in the mine. You know, when the CO2 concentration is so abstract, of course they matter very much, but nobody sees CO2. And um, that's a very important um, uh, lesson for, from your talk, uh, with such wonderful animations showing the, the um, melting of those glaciers. The second very important um, fact you highlight at us is that the, the melting of those glaciers matter for many aspects, for water resources, for sea level, and ultimately for people and people well-being. But then the third element is at least as important as the two previous ones, and that is that uh, the future of glaciers very much uh, depends still uh, on the emission trajectories uh, we will be uh, following in the coming years and decades. So to a large extent, the future is still in our hands, and that's very important. So the level of ambition that is discussed here and that will be discussed again next year at COP26 really matter for the future of glaciers and the cryosphere in general, as the report released today uh, so eloquently uh, shows. By the way, for those of you speaking French, may I hijack this uh, intervention a second just to uh, mention the availability of this newsletter. Uh, C'est la lettre de la plateforme Wallonne pour le GIEC, publiée en Belgique. Uh, C'est une lettre publiée électroniquement uh, et qui est disponible gratuitement pour ceux qui sont intéressés. Je peux vous donner l'adresse uh, où c'est uh, disponible. Et le dernier numéro, the last issue, is uh, devoted to the ocean and the cryosphere report, uh, the special report of the IPCC. GIEC is the same as IPCC in French, is the French acronym. Um, and with your permission, I have two questions. Um, the first is, we are just ten, ten years after the Copenhagen conference, COP15. I was vice chair of the IPCC then. This was just after, this was two years after the publication of the uh, fourth assessment report. And as you certainly do remember, there was that very artificial controversy uh, taking place after uh, or starting uh, towards the end of the uh, Copenhagen conference 10 years ago about the uh, future of the Malayan glaciers. Because on page 432 or something of the Working Group 2 contribution of AR4, there was uh, a paragraph which has been uh, not reviewed enough, probably, where it was written that the, uh, basically the Himalayan glaciers would disappear by 2035. And my question is, could you maybe comment 10 years later of, on what uh, you would write uh, instead that paragraph today with the knowledge we have now about those uh, glaciers in Himalaya? Um, in, in a few words, so that uh, everybody can, can um, use that uh, answer. And the second uh, question I have, uh, and last question I have is, are the uh, efforts uh, made in, uh, in uh, some uh, places to try to protect glaciers with uh, plastic or textile sheets, do, are they any useful or are they, or are they just distracting from the need to reduce emissions to uh, protect those glaciers in the long term. 
Thank you very much. Uh, the first question about the Himalaya, um, the projections, different studies show that by the end of the century, 2100, the glaciers in high mountain Asia will lose between about 30-33% under RCP 2.6 and about 66 or something percent under RCP 8.5. So far away from this disappearance in 2035. That was, a, I mean, complete error. The positive thing of this error was actually before, we hardly had any information on glacier mass changes, runoff changes. Now, there's hundreds of publications and studies from around the world in this area. So the boost in knowledge was essentially triggered by this error. So that is sort of a positive side effect, because now we know so much more. And the other question about the, um, actually this one, figure I showed, uh, where is it? This one here, you might have noticed why this is so white. This is exactly what they're doing. They're covering the glacier here, the Rona glacier, in, with white to protect it. This works locally because, of course, uh, the reflectivity, albedo, makes a big difference. But it's a drop in the water. I mean, it's, it makes no, I mean, there's no way you can protect the glaciers in the world like that. This is just locally, very, very local, you can do something about it. Maybe enhance like a skiing resort for another few years or so. So that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much, uh, Anil Mishra from UNESCO. Very interesting talk. Um, I have two questions. In one of the slides, you saw the Central Asian Glacier runoff. Central Asian Glacier consists of, uh, the definition of Central Asia also needs to be taken into consideration. There is Pamir, there is Tian Shan, and both uh, Western Tian Shan and Eastern Tian Shan uh, respond very differently. How do you really uh, make it a Central Asian? The second question is particularly related to runoff. Whether the runoff, uh, the glacier melt runoff is taken from end of the glacier tongue or at the river estuaries. Because if you consider some of the high mountain um, glaciers, it's totally different. Oh yeah. You know, you have a you have to consider monsoon uh, contribution to it. So whether that runoff is uh, taken from the tongue of the, uh, the end of the tongue of the glacier or uh, towards the end. Thank you very much. So. There's definitely huge regional differences, and I didn't show this slide. Here, we, you looked at 22 different regions. You can, how the glaciers are changing. There's a huge difference where you are, that's correct. For the glacier runoff, uh, what we did is essentially the, all the water that comes out of the uh, glacier at the moment, and that, and we, um, so it's essentially the runoff from the initially glacierized region. So, it doesn't matter if it's rain or if it's glacier melt or if it's snow melt, what it is, it's the runoff of the initially glacierized region. So it includes everything. Not all the glacier contributes um, um, uh, in the same pattern. It's, uh, there is a yes. significant difference. Yes, there's a huge difference. I mean, this is why you see these in, in enormous differences in the peak water because they do react differently. So that's absolutely correct. Uh, questions? I have two questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, those who study gla 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 glaciers, where, where should they start focusing more? Like maybe there, do you think there are places that haven't been that much studied and because they are retrieving faster, there should be more presence of glaciologists. Uh, that's one. And the second one is what's the role of citizens? Um, and how aware do you think they are of, of this reality of glaciers melting and what can we do about it? Um, where to study focus, it depends on the purpose. I would say for sea level rise, what is very little known is actually the glaciers around Antarctica. It's 132 square uh, thousand square kilometers of ice and how they are behaving is not very much known. So for sea level rise, that, that's an area. Um, but then for like stream flow, 
um, it's definitely the areas that uh, still have peak water in front of them, uh, like High Mountain Asia, um, and definitely the regions where it matters. I mean, where people want to build hydropower, where use the water for agriculture and so on. So even though we have this boost of studies, I mean, it's, it's still in a way in its infancy to really understand everything. Yeah, and the second one, like the role of citizens and how aware do you think citizens in, are about the reality of glaciers? I'm not sure what you're aiming at, but of course, the role of citizens is also to distribute the message. Like all of all of you who know know who know about glaciers and the effects, sort of distribute that knowledge, especially to, to policymakers, and make clear that there are impacts and that they are important. As on the impacts on the economy and you know, on people, I found the um, example with this cruise ship not so well, terribly <laughs> important because uh, I, well, I think we should abandon cruising anyway. Yeah. But, um, but the economic impacts of, of seawater uh, level rise, I mean, do you have any estimates, even rough estimates, what that would mean for the world economy? And should we not concentrate more on these issues, like, uh, well, all the cities which are close to the sea uh, shore, and uh, that must be huge impact, and also for islands disappearing, all these things. Uh, should we not focus more on this? On these oh, issues? yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but of course, sea level rise, it's, it's many components, and I don't know, uh, uh, there's probably something in the SROC report about the economic losses. But I think that is also an area where there needs to be more research, I mean, essentially the collaboration with economists and social scientists to really quantify that impact. I don't know how much has been done. Maybe, Carolina, you know more? Hmm? AR6. Here, AR6, it's coming. <laughs> but we had problems also in our mountain chapter really finding studies that quantify the impact. And that's why I just, I mean, the Juno, of course, I, I totally agree, but it's just an example that it can impact the local economy. But there's not very, we couldn't find many studies that really quantify and put numbers on it. So hopefully that is coming. Any more questions? As a fellow IPCC author, Regina, it was a pleasure working uh, also with you on SROC. Um, as a piece of advice, and I guess that also tags in from the uh, comment just made earlier about what are the sorts of questions that we still need to address for uh, in AR6. We still have a cross-chapter paper, Mountains, uh, that will take up a lot of the threads that uh, were started uh, in, in SROC. Um, what would be your advice uh, to, to ask the fellow group that are working in AR6 on this chapter um, in how we engage with the new knowledge that's now coming and also how to present that to, to, the, to the public, to the I IPCC work? I would say, I mean, what, what I just said, that the economic impact, that is really an area of like, and there, I mean, just a few weeks ago, a paper came out when the glaciers retreat, if they were disappeared completely, how many lakes there would be and how that could impact the, what is the hydropower potential. And that's a nice example of like looking at really economic effects. And that hasn't been done very much in the past, and I think that's really where, where in the future there must be, uh, should be a lot more studies together with social scientists and economists to really look at those impacts. Do we have any more questions for Professor Hawk? All clear? Well, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. So the next talk we're going to have this morning will be a live connection, a video, perfect, focusing on the polar oceans. And that will be at 11. So make sure you do not miss it at 11 on the polar oceans. Thank you. Um, polar oceans and uh, 
this was part of the Arctic Council event, so it is under uh, the December 9th um, Polar Oceans 2 video if you want to look at it. But this is a presentation she gave at that Arctic Council event. And the presentation is fairly brief, it's about 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started with this uh, Polar Oceans video, and uh, hopefully it will work. Some of the biological responses of the Arctic Ocean 
Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, background to some of the summarise some of the results from the report, but then go into a bit more of unpacking those studies to explain how some of these ecosystem impacts are likely to come out um, and how the interactions between species responses may result in food chain responses. Um, I apologise, I'm suffering from a bit of a cough and cold, so if I cough all the way through this, I really do apologise. So this is another image of a food web. Um, the Arctic Council report, the AMAP report, really tried to cover as much as possible of the food web um, as is uh, available in the literature, um, ranging right through from viruses through to zooplankton, which are uh, plankton, planktonic animals that float around in the sea, phytoplankton, the, the algae of the sea, through to fish um, and hydrotrophic levels. So as you can see from this graph here, this is um, the total number of studies that were used in the Arctic Council report, 186 studies on ocean acidification. But what's important to note is that actually only 40% of those studies are from Arctic-specific or sub-Arctic-specific studies, which means that we really lack a lot of the detailed knowledge that we need to understand Arctic-specific processes. And so what we're trying to do is uh, take away principles and mechanisms from the studies that we've done at lower latitudes to look at how we can apply those to the northern um, communities and the northern uh, food webs. Because at the moment, we just don't have the ability to get to the Arctic um, as much as we would like to be able to study something that is actually an ongoing experiment. And we need to know the important processes that are going on now so that we can make predictions and enhance our ability to predict. So the key findings, I'm going to go straight to the conclusions from the report, really, were that ocean acidification has the potential to drive change in marine systems. Change can either come directly on specific species or it can come indirectly through um, different effects on the interaction between species. The likely, likely there's going to be a great heterogeneity in responses. Some responses of organisms will be positive, some are negative, um, and some will have no response. And I'll go through a little bit more of those aspects in detail in a minute. But we're really, my point here is that we need to understand these mechanisms and the processes, some of the key biological processes and mechanisms, so that we can apply those to Arctic communities. So this is a summary slide actually from a paper that was released in 2013, Kirsty Croker's work, um, where she reviewed um, at that time the available ocean acidification literature. Um, and as you can see, the red and pink uh, markers indicate negative responses. Yellow indicates a neutral response, neither positive or negative. Green represents a uh, positive response, and gray is where there was no studies done at that time. So you can see there's a, quite a lot of red and pink, um, and only a couple of greens. The greens potentially uh, are mostly in algal species, so fleshy algal and phytoplankton tend to respond positively to ocean acidification because of the enhanced CO2, allowing them to increase photosynthesis. That's not always the case, but it seems to be the general trend. Whereas the calcified organisms you have on the far side, the calcified algae, the corals, the coccolithophores, mollusks, echinoderms, all those organisms that rely on shells, build shells, tend to generally have a negative response. One of the key things we learned from these reviews is that most of the experiments done to date have been done on single species experiments. And that's a concern for us because we need to start thinking about multiple stresses, but also multiple interactions between species. As you can see, there's also been a big focus on calcifying species and the are firing response. I'll just give a little update on fish because there wasn't many studies done in 2013 on fish, specifically for the Arctic. Uh, the top 29 most landed fish, if you go by uh, tons, in the Arctic and subarctic, just seven species of those have been looked at with response to ocean acidification, and that should be a concern to us. We need to investigate those. Eleven studies were carried out on those seven species. Eight of those showed negative responses to ocean acidification. Most of them were on the early life stages and the larvae and the eggs and only three showed neutral responses. 
uh, which is important because if you look at the SROC report, which suggests that fisheries are going to be moving northward, those projections don't yet include any of those effects of ocean acidification. So I'm going to go a little bit more into the uh, biology um, and hopefully explain to you some of the mechanisms that are associated with how ocean acidification impacts species. And really, I think the key thing to think about is that energy matters. If you think of an organism, it's, um, you can think of it as a box of energy. It needs food to take in energy. It needs energy to maintain itself, to move, to metabolize, to regulate its growth. It needs to process energy, to calcify, if it's a calcifying organism, to grow and reproduce. And that can affect its survival and associated processes that link to ecosystem state and function. Um, several years ago now, we conducted a study where we looked at um, calcifying organisms, and we found that they were actually able to maintain their calcification shells. Um, we did a multiple, um, we did a study on different organisms. If you follow the blue line, um, if you have live animals with calcified material, they're actually able to maintain their calcifying, their calcified shells under um, low pH conditions, so under aragonetic, um, undersaturated conditions. Um, whereas if you get the dead, the shell itself, just a, a piece of shell material or a piece of arm, in the case of a brittle star, and put that into um, undersaturated aragonite conditions, then it will just dissolve away. So what this is, is telling us is that live animals are actually able to do something to maintain their shells. Um, but this comes at a cost. If you can't increase the energy, then that comes at a cost for somewhere else. That energy has to come from somewhere. So in the case of brittle stars, that cost came as muscle wastage. In the case of the limpets, it came to reduce growth. And the same with um, the barnacles, they had reduced growth. In the case of mussels, they had a reduced health. So you can see that organisms, even if they're, they're putting more energy into maintaining their shells because they, that's important, they need it to survive, but that's m resulting in them having other impacts as a result. Um, but what we have also found since then is that energy can, if you increase the food supply, you can actually overcome some of these impacts. So in a high food situation for mussels, for example, you can increase growth even at lower, at high CO2 or low pH conditions, and you can increase, uh, you can prevent dissolution or you can reduce the amount of dissolution. So one of the questions then really is, will food supply increase in the Arctic and allow these species to overcome these issues? The SMAC report, I think, suggests that about 10 to 20% increase in primary production in the Arctic is expected in the future. But that's a issue, another issue because it's very complicated in the Arctic with the sea ice loss and the nutrient regime may change. Um, so even if that does increase, we have to think about how these organisms are going to get access to that food. One of the things we've also found that, okay, food may increase, but the food quality also feeds back on these organisms. There's been studies done, this is just one example, where phytoplankton, um, the main food source at the bottom of the food chain, have been exposed to low pH conditions, and their change in their energy, their nutrient status, um, comes as a result of that change in the pH conditions. That directly impacts, if you feed that changed phytoplankton to uh, copepods, for example, which are a secondary consumer, a herbivore, then they will change their respiration rates and their development rates, for example, as well, uh, are altered by those changes in nutrient structure. So changes in food quality also can impact indirectly the um, secondary consumers. There's also interactions between predator and prey. We found this was an early study in clownfish, but it's also been shown in pink salmon, which are really relevant to the Arctic. Um, particularly in the early life stages, the, larvae, the juvenile stages, that if you have a low pH condition, then you, these fish are not able to detect predators. They have a change in their olfactory sensors that decreases their ability to detect um, the cues from predators, and therefore they spend longer in the presence of predators. So actually, in the change of 
they're actually it, it's actually changing the way that the cues are um, being detected by the organisms. So what we see is a decrease in predator avoidance and detection. We also can think about um, what an organism experiences. Ex organisms live in a variable world. In some cases, it's very variable. In the Arctic, it, can, it depends where you live um, for an organism, how much variability experiences. Generally, what we find is that if an organism experiences a wide level of variability, it tends to have a higher tolerance to change. If it sees less variability in its natural environment, it hasn't developed over hundreds of years, it hasn't evolved to experience, um, to adapt to those changes, and therefore is less likely to be able to respond to change. And this is one example we did in the Canadian Arctic, where we, if you think about behavior as well as something that can expose um, organisms to different environments. Here we have two copepod species, a uh, calanus species and an Orthiona species, which is much smaller. Uh, the Calanus species uh, is this one which vertically migrates over 200 meters every day and experiences naturally a pH range of maybe between 7.9 and 8.1, which is what the global average pH is going to decrease by in the future. Whereas the Orthiona species in this location don't vertically migrate and don't experience that natural variability. If you then take those species and put them in the laboratory and conduct ocean acidification experiments, you can see from figure A that actually the survival rates of the adults of those species doesn't really get affected by low pH conditions compared to the Othiona, which drop about 40% survival rate in the, higher, in the low pH conditions. And the same for the, the Norpiae, the early life stages of those species. And just to finish off, this is one other example of where we can think about uh, processes. Um, most biological processes are related to temperature. They, we call them um, temperature response curves. And this was some recent work by Dal Kertal, who looked at the temperature response for egg survival of two fish species, Atlantic cod and polar cod. Um, and then uh, looked at the ocean acidification effect on that temperature response curve. And what you can think about is that if you are lower, further down on the temperature response and your temperature is increasing as well as ocean acidification, then maybe the response you see will be a positive response because the temperature and ocean acidification response will interact. Whereas if you're an Arctic species further along towards the top of your temperature range already, then those, those uh, responses are generally going to be a negative response. So I'm just going to summarize really by going back to the food web. And we've seen that increased primary reduction may be possible in the Arctic, but that's still a little bit of an unknown. But it probably will result in a, size in the, a shift in the phytoplankton size structure. Um, but we think that maybe the food quality and the nutritional status of phytoplankton may well change. That will result in changes in key secondary consumers. Um, there may be some uh, responses directly on secondary consumers, um, but the nutritional uh, impact is probably going to be the one that affects them the most. There's likely to be a change in size in organisms, particularly of the calcified organisms. What we seem to be finding is that they tend to get smaller because they need more energy to remain there, keep their shells. And that can have direct impacts on we see direct impacts on fish early life stages, but there's also this problem of predator-prey interactions. So there's a complicated set of uh, responses, and I hope I've given you a summary to just highlight how um, these ocean acidification impacts can uh, result in impacts on species and ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Findlay, for this interesting, your interesting intro introduction. And the final picture especially shows that everything is connected in, this, in terms of the ecology of the seas and how they're affected by, by acidification. Um, the final speaker of the panel is Lisa Koperkolak. She is Vice President of, the International Af of International Affairs at the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Canada. Lisa Kopikulak was born in Putirinituk, 
on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay in northern Quebec. Uh, she had her primary education at her home town and then later on went to university in the south having earned her uh, degree, uh, bachelor degree in political science at Concordia University in Montreal and a master's degree in anthropology from Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, her areas of interest include Inuit political and community development and education, justice, law and the northern environment and the Inuit culture and language. I could go on and on about, <laughs> about Lisa and her, her accomplishments, both in academia and public service and as elected representative of her people, but I think we are now hearing uh, the point of view of how as the, case, as the vacation of the oceans will and may affect people in the region uh, as, as they are the ones that will be in the end taking the consequences of, of the changes happening. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. And it's been a real pleasure to hear mention of uh, travel to the Arctic, to Alaska, and the importance of indigenous people from our previous speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank the Arctic Council and organizers for this opportunity to share our voice on effects of ocean acidification on our Inuit communities. Really, how I pronounce my name may be difficult for most of you, so we say Koper Kualuk, uh, and um, at home, it's Koper Kualuk, uh, based on our mother tongue, Inuktitut, in Canada. I'm the Vice President of the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada, and I'm here to pass the message about how our healthy ecosystem is central to our identity, our health and well-being, food security, and cultural sustainability. So I would like to take first a moment to tell you about Inuit in the circumpolar world. We are a people, Inuit, who live in the circumpolar region, which makes us an international people. And we have several different names for ourselves. In Chukotka, that is in Russia, we are Yupit. In Alaska, there are Inupiat and Yupit. And in Canada, there are Inuvialuit and Inuit. And in Greenland, Galahlit Nunat, there are Galahlit. But we share one culture and one language. We number over 180,000 Inuit living not only in the circumpolar region, but also in urban areas, in the southern urban areas. Uh, but we call our homeland Inuit Nunat. That means Inuit homeland, where we have lived for thousands of years. So ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Council, holds a general assembly every four years at which delegates from the circumpolar region elect a new chair and an executive council to which I'm part and develop policies and adopt resolutions that will guide the activities of the organization for the coming term, that is the next four years. And the general assembly is the heart of the organization providing an opportunity for sharing information and discussing common concerns, which we have all in the circumpolar region, debating issues, for we are also uh, having different points of views on different issues, and strengthening the bonds of all Inuit in the circumpolar region. So in the General Assembly of 2018, um, which where I began my mandate, we concluded with the Utkervik Declaration. And Utkervik is what used to be called Barrow in Alaska. And that's where our General Assembly took place. And our declaration 
holds key sections that include uh, sustainable wildlife management and environment and indigenous knowledge. We have over 57, 53 sections in our declaration, but section 27 directs ICC to facilitate the development of international Inuit protocols on the equitable and ethical utilization of indigenous knowledge and engagement of Inuit communities to provide the guidance to international floor, fora such as the Arctic Council. I'd like to share here the photo of my uh, grandfather um, who raised me as he influenced me for a large part in continuing my education and uh, doing my best to contribute to our Inuit communities. So when I participate to events like this, it is he uh, who, who gives me my foundation and the knowledge. Um, he knew our ways, he was very proud of where we came from, he knew our environment inside and out. He knew all of the land where we live in Nunavik, and he knew everywhere to go on the Arctic uh, uh, waters uh, around Nunavik, because uh, we are a, a coastal people, and um, I like to bring this Inuit knowledge that he, he shared with me um, and to these forums. And I share this indigenous knowledge with scientists and policymakers to understand the Arctic and the changes in our world so we can make decisions based on our collective knowledge. As I mentioned, we are part of the Arctic ecosystem. Inuit culture and biodiversity are intricately tied. Importantly, we are a marine people who depend upon the Arctic sea ice flowage and polynias for our food security. It is our critical infrastructure, and as many say, it is our highway to travel upon, and it binds us to our culture. Protecting the marine environment and the animals is the utmost importance for us. Indigenous peoples and systems in the Arctic are disproportionately affected by the impacts of global warning, warming. Inuit have been bringing warnings about global warming to the international community as far back as the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. ICC is actively participating in international climate change action and policy through our status as an observer to the United Nations. In Canada, we released a national Inuit climate change strategy. ICC also made a significant contribution to the text of the IPCC special report on ocean and cryosphere, focusing on the importance of Inuit knowledge, Inuit participation, and Inuit self-determination in research, and to the 2018 Arctic Ocean Acidification AMAP assessment. As you heard very well, the Arctic Ocean acidity levels have been increasing at twice the rate compared to the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The loss of sea ice has been connected to increases in acidification in the Arctic. The water in the Arctic is also colder, so it takes up more carbon dioxide and fresh water influx from rivers emptying into the Arctic Ocean, along with melting sea ice, also contributing to the lowering of pH of the ocean. The food web in the Arctic Ocean is very sensitive. So a significant increase in the population of one species or the disappearance of another could have dramatic ripple effects on the entire Arctic marine ecosystem. And we are a part of this ecosystem. At the moment, we don't know what the tipping points are for Arctic marine ecosystems. So there is a lot of monitoring research projects underway 
and these should continue with Inuit participation and Inuit in the lead. It is very important to include indigenous or what I call Inuit knowledge with all these. Uh I'm sorry to cut this off, but we need to, I know <laughs> uh, this is available online, but we, we need to technically figure out how we're going to connect to Stockholm and the next presentation. And we don't want to start that at 11.30, so um, my apologies. de señales, pero la de Easy no la encuentra. Sí, Easy arroba algo.
No, that's my video, but I, I should be muted because we don't want my sound. I can't hear him. Yeah, the problem is... You were unmuted. Unmuted myself. I should be muted too. We really need yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right. yourself, yeah. yeah. I'll just stay on the line. Can you, can you hear me? He's, uh, he's going to, he thinks there might be a problem with his uh, uh, connection. Uh, uh, and so he's going to load back in on his laptop. Okay. So okay. Perfect. So I'll just send you this. Okay. Well, we're in it. Um, we should have Heidi unmute herself and say something. Yes, okay, yeah, testing, testing, one, two, three, Hi. testing. Testing, can you see my, uh, uh, my slides now? First, climate and carbon, uh, as detailed in the Cryosphere 1.5 report. So I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors, Sue Natalia of the Woods Hole Research Center and Sarah Chadburn of the University of Exeter, who helped me put, put this presentation together. So, what is permafrost? Uh, introduction to, to, to what it is that we're interested in and what we're talking about. Permafrost is ground that remains frozen all year round. So permafrost can extend far into the ground, uh, it can be kilometers deep, in many places it's just a few meters thick. And uh, permafrost uh, is composed of not only frozen soil, but also importantly a lot of organic material, and in places a lot of ground ice. So ice that, that is formed in the ground over time. So in the right hand picture here you see a massive wall of permafrost being exposed, and a lot of that ground is actually pure ice. 
On the left hand side you see a peatland, an organic soil that has accumulated over time and that is frozen. So in that soil we have actually pure organics and not so much mineral soil. So permafrost is something that covers a large part of the northern hemisphere. Around, around 14 million square kilometers is covered or is it affected by permafrost. So that is basically that is the area of, of the European Union times three, so it's a really large area. And importantly, most permafrost and the material contained in it is several thousand years old. So as we are thawing this permafrost, we are remobilizing carbon that has So we are now at plus one degree over pre-industrial temperatures. <clears throat> and this is projected to have already have caused quite a large loss of permafrost. This map shows estimated loss of permafrost since the pre-industrial time as a function of this one degree global warming. Uh, and you see the really dark red colors indicate places where the permafrost is completely gone, while the scale that goes from yellow into the red indicates how much deepening has occurred in the active layer of the permafrost. The active layer is the surface of the soil, the skin, so to say, of the permafrost. So the upper part, which actually thaws out every summer and then refreezes in winter and thaws out and then refreezes. So you have this dynamic component to the upper part of the permafrost. But we do see an increase or a deepening of that active layer as well as, as complete loss. Now, warming is will continue and also permafrost loss is, is, is projected to, to continue. This graph indicates how much volume of permafrost will thaw. So this is the volume of near surface permafrost that would thaw in, you see the, the, the scale on the left hand side is trillion cubic meters. So this is you know, a really a really large scale. For at one and a half degrees, we, we lose a little bit more than two trillion. And at two degrees global warming, the loss is actually more than double. So we are up to six trillion cubic meters of permafrost loss. And at three degrees global warming, the loss is very substantial. On the right hand side, you see how much this loss is in, in relation percent to present day permafrost. So this high warming scenario, we're losing almost half of the permafrost, while at the 1.5 degree target, we're actually only losing about 10% of the permafrost, which would be which, which is much preferable to the, to the higher warming scenarios. Uh, we can also flip this and instead of thinking of how much permafrost we're losing, we can this this, I just want to illustrate here that we, we can also save this much permafrost by rapid action and rapid emission reduction. Uh, and why are we then concerned by the loss of permafrost? Of course, it affects ecological systems, habitats, people that live on it, on, on the permafrost in the Arctic. But I think the main concern in the context of, of the climate negotiations is the permafrost carbon feedback, which is uh, a feedback that as temperatures rise, Permafrost will start to thaw, and because of the high organic m m material in the in the permafrost, this will start to, de to decay, and carbon dioxide and methane is released to the atmosphere, which further feeds warming. So this is a positive feedback loop that reinforces climate warming and can be quite potential, has a lot of potential. Uh, and this is extra concerning regarding the permafrost because of the large carbon pool that it holds. This bubble plot shows the sizes of the different active pools in the global carbon cycle. So the pools that turn over at a time scale that is relevant to humans. On the top we have the atmosphere, which is around 880 gigatons. The grey shaded area is the pre-industrial atmosphere, what it was we started emitting CO2. Then you have the green bar, which is the, uh, the green uh, bubble, which is vegetation. Vegetation stores something around 500 gigatons of carbon. And then the biggest pool, active pool in the global carbon cycle are the soils. So if you go down to three meters depth in soils all over the world, they are estimated to contain 2,500 gigatons of carbon. So this is a very big, big stock. And permafrost is, of course, part of the soil carbon and overlaps this estimate. And permafrost alone, or from the permafrost region, is estimated to hold between 1,400 and 1,600 gigatons twice as much as all of the carbon, three times as much as all living vegetation. So this is, this is really concerning, and so I have a quote from Marcus Aurelius, what we do now echoes in eternity. So my, um, 
recognize it's based on the movie Gladiator, but it's, it's actually attributable to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so what I mean by this is that we have time for action now, but what we do or what we decide to not do has a very long-term impact, because, or at least well beyond the year 2100, for sure. The thing with permafrost is that it responds slowly, but inevitably to war. And uh, if we uh, start to thaw, or if we continue to thaw the, the permafrost at ever greater rates, the thaw will continue for centuries, even if the temperature stabilized right now. Uh, so, the, uh, so the present day losses that we're seeing, they are not yet in equilibrium with the, with, with the current climate. So even if we stabilize temperatures, it will. And we do project, the models project, substantial continued increases in carbon emissions for several centuries beyond the end of this century. So this short time, you know, time perspective of the end of this century is not really relevant. Well, it is relevant for permafrost, but even more relevant is to think long term. So what emissions do models predict? Uh, how much uh, CO2 do we, do, we, do we expect and how fast do we expect it? So this graph shows by the end of this century for, 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 for three different warming scenarios. And we're looking, and on the left-hand side, you see gigatons of CO2 two equivalents emitted cumulatively during that period. One gigaton is one billion tons uh, of, of, of CO2. And we, we're seeing something around 100 gigatons from, from models on, in the low warming scenario, which exceed, and then it exceeds 200, 200 gigatons uh, in, the, in the really warm scenario at, at, at four degrees. And importantly, if we think of allowing overshoot scenarios where the temperature exceeds 1.5 and then goes back down again, this is expected to add around 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent to, to, uh, to emissions even under a 1.5 scenario because the permafrost that thaws under, during the overshoot will keep, keep emitting. And if we look at multiple centuries, uh, we see you know, roughly a doubling of the cumulative emissions over many centuries, so that even at, in a 1.5 degree warming scenario, we are committed to, to, to emissions of exceeding two, potentially exceeding 200. Uh, so this is something that in, in essence commits us to, to negative emission technologies and use the use of negative emission technologies for multiple centuries. Now, the thing is that I just showed you what the climate models say. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not the full picture. There are processes that are called abrupt thaw processes, which is what you see in this photograph here. And this is when quite a lot, you know, when, when, when abrupt, uh, uh, an abrupt thaw event is when thaw starts to penetrate deeper into the soil, it's, it, it melts the ground ice, and you get a collapse of the whole area. And this can access a lot more carbon, but a lot quicker than the, than, than the more gradual active layer deepening, which is in the models. So if we have a, a schematic of how abrupt thaw works, on the left, on the far left, you have stable permafrost. You see it's ice rich. You see the ground ice in, drawn in there. And this ecosystem is a long-term sink of CO2 and a neutral, uh, uh, a neutral when it comes to methane. But as permafrost starts to degrade, you see on the, on the right there, you get a loss of ground ice, and when the ice disappears, the ground starts to slump down because the volume the ice was filling isn't longer occupied by anything. And this actually pushes the system into a CO2 source over longer times, uh, as carbon that was stored in the permafrost starts to degrade. <coughs> and as time progresses even more, we can get abrupt thaw collapse. This is when all of the ground ice is gone, the ground surface simply collapses in and can become a lake or a wetland instead. And in this case, if it's a post thaw lake, we would actually see, it, see, see both a source of uh, carbon dioxide and of methane. Uh, and, this, and the methane is formed because uh, these uh, post thaw environments tend to be anaerobic, so there's no oxygen there, which, which leads to methane. Methane is, of course, a much more potent CO2, uh, greenhouse gas than the, than, than the carbon dioxide. And a recent study, uh, which is in press uh, or accepted the, now in Nature Geoscience, led by Mary Turetsky, uh, showed that if you take all the different abrupt thaw uh, landforms that, that can form and model this into the future in a sort of simplified box model approach, we find that this almost doubles the radiative forcing compared to the projected gradual thaw that is in 
So uh, if we uh, if we think of the permafrost carbon feedback, for instance, in this case, it's the RCP 4.5 scenario, which is roughly equivalent to a two degree global warming. It was expected, uh, based on the models, that it would emit roughly it emits roughly one gigaton of carbon now, and by the end of this uh, of this uh, century, it would be plus two gigatons of CO2 equivalent, which is roughly half of EU 28 emissions. But if we add the abrupt thaw, this rises to three or four gigaton CO2 equivalent per, per year by the end of the century, which is roughly as much as the EU emits right now. Only from, uh, this, this will come then only from the permafrost. And if you think of long-term effects, where, where, where the emissions actually increase, we project something around eight to nine gigatons by the year 2300. So with long term, it's going to increase even more. And we're, we're up to twice as much as the EU emits every year. So this, of course, has implications for our sort of remaining allowable emissions. How much, uh, how much carbon can we humans emit and still stay under 1.5 or 2 degrees? So what we see here is the full bar, including the both red and the pink, is the remaining emission budgets as, as per the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees warming, roughly 400 gigatons uh, for 1.5 for 1 degrees of warming, uh, almost 1,200 for 2 degrees of warming. And the pink part here shows how big a reduction in the carbon budget we will have to do if we also account for the permafrost release, which is very substantial. You see in the low, in the low warming scenario, we are eating it up by more than a third. So this is really, uh, you know, cause for concern and cause for a call for stronger action to really, because the only way we can limit permafrost emissions is to limit human emissions. There's no other way to, to, to sort of protect the permafrost. The only thing we can do is emit less. Uh, and we are seeing this, this, this is happening right now. Uh, so a massive thaw is occurring even in very, very cold permafrost in the high Canadian Arctic. This photograph shows the difference in, a, in, a, in the same site between 2005 and 2016, where the tundra has completely shifted character, it has slumped down, the ground ice has disappeared, lakes are starting to form, and these landforms are now missing. And the thing is that this was not supposed to happen for another 70 years, according to, 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 to one of the best permafrost models around. And this is because the model did not it was not able to account for the abrupt thaw process, the disappearance of ground ice, which, which accelerated this, this, this loss. And there's also, when you think about permafrost and particularly abrupt thaw, there's a really strong case for limiting warming to one and a half degree, but also to, for avoiding overshoot. This little schematic shows time on the x on the lower axis and temperature going up on, on, on the y axis. And you see a green scenario which takes us to the tar target temperature without overshoot. And you see a red scenario which overshoots the target temperature and then goes back down. And then the shaded red area is indicates the increase in feedback we would expect, which would actually push us even higher above the overshoot scenario. Now, overshoot feedbacks will drive more, 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 more warming for sure. But the important thing I want to note is that abrupt thaw and collapse is non-reversible. So once this has happened, we will see additional long-term greenhouse gas forcing from abrupt thaw. Uh, so this orange line here is meant to represent forcing that comes from the permafrost. And what, what I want to show here is that this will not go back down when the temperature goes back down. It will continue emitting for a really long time. Over a century, over many hundreds of years, it will come down again, but it will take a so to conclude this summary on the permafrost carbon feedbacks, uh, the permafrost carbon feedback will severely limit the remaining carbon budget. So this is a ma major concern. And we do also see that rapid emission reductions saves massive areas of permafrost. We saw factor two, more than a factor two of increased loss at a, at a two degree rate compared to the 1.5 percent. If we account for the abrupt pro thaw processes, so this nearly doubles the permafrost feedback. And the importantly, the permafrost carbon feedback will respond over multiple centuries to greenhouse gas emissions made today, and thermocarst is largely, is largely irreversible at policy. And 
global stabilization at 1.5 instead of the trajectories to take us well above about 2 degrees could avoid permafrost emissions roughly equivalent to all of the emissions from the 20th. Thank you. I don't know if we are we able to take questions. Or? Yeah, thank you, Gustav. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Yeah, so maybe if the audience has questions, um, you can, I think the best way to do it maybe is to come up to my computer and ask so Gustav can hear. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah? Yeah, why don't you come on up and say <laughs> into the computer? All right, yeah, we have one question coming up. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, uh, are there problems for the people that live in that area uh, for the stability of the, the, the ground? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we heard that for Russia there are a lot of uh, advantages for due to global warming because, uh, you know, there it's cold and global warming uh, with, it's more less cold. So what about yeah. the, the, the problem for, for infrastructure? <laughs> There are, yeah, thank, thank you, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there are very significant problems for infrastructure. So for the people that live in the Arctic or in the permafrost regions, and there are about 4 million people living on permafrost, uh, and there's a lot of infrastructure there. And uh, when the permafrost thaws, this starts to slump down, houses are destroyed, roads disappear. Uh, earlier, last week at, at the COP, when I was down there, we heard of, you know, how people that uh, that live in the Arctic used to uh, used to be able to they, they used to need to prop up their houses now and again, but now they have to do it several times a year because the permafrost thaw is just making their houses settle and become crooked. Uh, and um, also at a sort of a regional scale, we do see that there's a lot of a lot of oil and gas infrastructure in the permafrost region, especially in Russia, but also in North America. So we also will see increased impact on oil and gas infrastructure from permafrost thaw, where uh, oil fields uh, or gas pipelines can actually can actually be affected by by the thaw. Uh, and of course, there are there are other there are also impacts for for indigenous uh, sort of indigenous use of the land, uh, the old travel routes that the reindeer herders used to be able to take in in, in Siberia are not accessible anymore because. Lakes have formed when permafrost thaws, and there are a lot of other impacts on, on, on the people living in the Arctic. All right, um, we have two more questions for you, I think. Okay. Do you want to come on up and ask it in here? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was curious to know if there's um, geographic differences in the um, amount of permafrost thaw. So, for example, like at similar latitudes that may, you know, be due to local factors? Uh, yeah, so, the, I mean, there is quite a big uh, latitudinal difference in, the, in where there is permafrost and also where it's thawing, mainly because, so in Siberia, it goes much further south. Because um, because of the very continental climate there, so even if they have quite warm summers, they have very cold winters in central Siberia, uh, and uh, so so in general we can say that permafrost is disappearing along its southern margins. Uh, it tends to stay longer in so locally it tends to stay longer in some parts of the landscape where it's sort of protected by. So like perhaps if, if, if you're in an area where there's very thick organic soil, like a peatland, this actually acts a little bit as a blanket and protects the permafrost during the warm summers. So it can sometimes thaw more slowly in peat-dominated areas. And in alpine areas, in mountain regions, you see the permafrost disappearing first in, in, air, in, in parts of mountains that get a lot of sunlight, for instance. Um, but uh, there are certainly sort of geographical differences. and. Uh, also, what we're seeing is actually that the warming of the permafrost is happening is more rapid in the in the in the high north. So, when the permafrost is really cold, it is also warming more quickly, and this is most likely due to the the Arctic amplification, which is this this uh, this phenomenon where global warming happens is much stronger the further north we get in the Arctic. So, in the high Arctic, the warming we're seeing is you know translating into even more. Uh, uh, 
increases in temperature, especially in the autumn, where the permafrost is quite sensitive to. So in the high Arctic, we do see a lot of warming of the permafrost. Um, Gustav, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. Do you know what the outlook is? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Do you know what the outlook is for including um, abrupt thaw processes in the CMIP-6 simulations or in even the AR-6 IPCC reports? So, um, so the, I mean the, the model, the Earth system model versions that went to that are committed now for, for CMIP-6. So then, you know, the, the set of model runs that are going to be the basis for much of the upcoming IPCC assessment report. They are, um, many of them do not, do not actually represent permafrost at all, actually. So a few models do have the model versions where permafrost is enabled, but some other models do not did not, some other modeling centers did not submit the, the versions of their models that, that do permafrost modeling best. Uh, and there is, abrupt thaw is not represented in any Earth system model, and it is likely going to be a few more years before that happens, I would think. There are quite exciting developments with a group in, in, in Oslo, it's Bastian Westerman, a professor there, who's, they are really managing to model abrupt thaw at the local scale, and, I, and that model uh, if that model can scale into an Earth system model, this is a potential solution that could bring it to the big scale. But so if the models are not going to have it in time for for the next IPCC report. But of course, the results that came out or that are coming out now in this paper, this separate paper on abrupt thaw, they will be accounted for because this paper came out uh, has come out well before the deadline for the next IPCC report. All right. Thank you, Gustav. Do we have any more questions? All right, thank you again. Thank you. Okay, bye, Gustav. Bye. All right, and I think I am up next to talk about ice sheets. All right, hello, my name is Hannah Baranis. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, I'm standing in for uh, Rob DeCanto, who is a, a professor at UMass and the co-director of the School of Earth and Sustainability. Um, he is also a lead author on the IPCC SROC report that just came out uh, a few months ago. Um, so there are really three things I want to communicate to you about ice sheets and sea level rise today. Um, the first is just some of the amazing science that has uh, led to our understanding of how ice sheets are going to respond to the current climate forcing. Um, the second is that when you look at projections of how ice sheets are going to respond to climate, and so how sea level will rise in response to climate, you often see these really big uh, uncertainties going into the future. Um, and hopefully by explaining some of the physical mechanisms behind these proce this process of ice sheet melting and sea level rise, um, I'd like to communicate that we're not uncertain about what is happening and what's going to happen. Um, what's uncertain is the timing. Um, and third, I think <laughs> I'll be talking a fair bit about passing thresholds and irreversible ice sheet melt. Um, and that can kind of sound uh, pretty disheartening and like a little bit of a doomsday speech. But um, like with all the other elements of the cryosphere we've been talking about, there's really a huge, even if ice sheets are going to continue melting, 
policy has a huge role to play um, and what the impacts will be like on people. All right, so let's jump in. Um, so we're here today to talk about the um, key messages in the Cryosphere 1.5 degree report. And so I know it's not the most exciting way to start a talk, but I just want to read some of the key ice sheet findings. Um, and then as we go through, I'll be kind of explaining the science behind some of them. So this is sort of uh, relates to what I said about the role of policy. Um, there's strong consensus that the risk that the risks of extensive, melt, extensive melting from the ice sheets increases as both the peak in global temperatures and the rate of warming rises. And this is kind of going to step through ice sheet responses to different temperature thresholds. So today, if we could hold the world at one degree above pre-industrial temperatures, we are still likely committed to a very slow but unavoidable one to three meters minimum of sea level rise, yet over thousands of years. And again, I'll be putting that into context a bit later in terms of impacts. Risks increase substantially at 1.5 degrees, with the possibility of 6 to 9 meters of sea level rise compared to today, coming from additional loss of Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet, though this too would likely take many centuries to occur. Okay, jumping up to 2 degrees uh, shows an even greater risk of devastating sea level rise, uh, because both ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland have thresholds for near complete melt somewhere near the 2 degree level. And the so this is the key role of policy. Uh, the duration and extent of warming above two degrees will increase the risk, speed, and inevitability of the above changes. However, these processes, even West Antarctic ice sheet collapse, can be slowed potentially by thousands of years if temperatures remain close to one and a half degrees, with an aim to return below that level as soon as possible. Okay, so let's start with what we've observed uh, over the last uh, little more than 100 years. Um, this is just a composite of all the tide gauge records uh, in the world, and you can see that sort of the number one observation is between 1880 and 2020, uh, sea level has been increasing. Um, and this number, 15 centimeters of sea level rise over the 20th century, is a number to keep in mind as I continue to show you projections for sea level rise. Um, so you can even see in this long tide gauge record that there's a little bit of an uptick at the end um, in terms of rate. So if we zoom in um, just to the satellite era where we can take really precise measurements of sea level from space, um, there's a clear kind of banana shape to that curve, which represents that the rate of sea level increase is increasing, which is what we call an acceleration. Um, so again, these two numbers to keep in mind, 15 centimeters of sea level rise over the 20th century. And in terms of rate, we're, about, we're currently at about three and a half millimeters per year of sea level rise. Um, and this is two times the rate we were at over the 20th century or in the 1900s. And that's that acceleration you're seeing at the edge of the curve. Um, and I want to make the point that um, Sea level rise does not impact everybody equally. Um, there's a lot of global variation um, in sea level rise, and this is NASA's view from space. So where I live in Boston, we're not feeling things that much right now, um, but these variations are caused by where temperature is increasing and where winds and currents are piling up warm water. And you can see that even with this 15 centimeter global average, there have been pretty devastating effects in the western tropical Pacific already. And this picture of regional variation is going to change as soon as ice sheets become more significant contributors to sea level rise. Um, and I'll, I'll explain some of that a bit later. So just to put that 15 centimeters in perspective, um, this map is showing that so the flood level that used to, on average, occur every 100 years, so a pretty devastating flood for a community. In what year will that historically 100-year flood occur annually. Um, and someone pointed out a couple days ago, it's sort of ironic that the places where you see black, where you, we already have the 100-year flood occurring annually, are pushed to the margins of this plot. So I think that there are some new versions coming out where the Pacific is right in the middle. Um, so rising sea levels are leading to more frequent extreme flood events. Um, and again, the impact is not equal. All right, so th this is kind of a crazy figure. It's, it's an advertisement for the SROC that just came out. But um, so if you're curious in learning more about each component that contributes to sea level rise, please take a harder look at this figure. Um, there are just a couple key things I want to point out. So over the 
20th century, the main contributor to global sea level rise uh, was thermal expansion. So just for a given mass of water, as it gets warmer, it takes up more space. Um, and then coming into the 21st century, that the contributions of sea level to sea level rise have been more balanced among thermal expansion and land-based ice. Um, and uh, Regina gave an excellent talk about the glacial contribution to sea level rise, so please come back again later this afternoon if you want to hear it again. Um, and if, in case you can't see it back there, there's another number up there, one half meter of sea level equivalent. So that means if you add up all the water locked in land-based, or in, um, in mountain glaciers, and you were to dump it in the ocean, that would be, on av that would be about half a meter of uh, global mean sea level rise. And so the recent uptick um, in rates of sea level rise, um, a lot of that has been due to sort of these two beasts in the corners. Um, the Greenland ice sheet, which has seven meters of sea level, sea level rise locked up in it, and the Antarctic ice sheet, which has 58 meters. Um, and that's gonna be our focus today. So uh, again, Greenland sits in the Northern Hemisphere, and Antarctica sits in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and so, so I'll be talking about some of the thresholds that are leading to melting of these two big ice sheets. And the two ice sheets are fundamentally very different. And so there are different mechanisms that are leading to melting in the two locations. So um, the two ice sheets melting will also have different impacts uh, on sea level rise, um, sort of as I alluded to before. Um, so. What you're looking at here, before you get too bogged down in the figure, I'll walk you through it. Um, ice sheets are so massive that they have gravity. Um, and so they actually slightly pull the ocean surface up towards them. And as they melt, they lose some of their gravity. And so you actually get sea level dropping around the ice sheets and sloshing up in other parts of the world. Um, second, because they have so much mass, they actually affect the uh, rotation of the planet. So as you melt them, we change our orbit a little bit. Okay, so this is showing, um, it's a fractional scale on the right, so a nice way to think of it is, so look at the um, interface between yellow and red uh, on the left-hand plot. That is showing, so for one meter of equivalent sea level rise lost from Greenland, along that yellow-orange interface, that's where you get one meter of sea level rise, which is sort of what you would expect. Everywhere in blue, sea level drops. Everywhere in red, sea level increases more than one meter. Um, in the West Antarctic ice sheet on the right, um, you can see that around North America, I've often called this the, the karma plot, um, you get about 130% of the global mean and sea level rise as you melt West Antarctica. Um, and I, I think a thing to point out here, we're, we're a little bit, we're still uncertain about the relative contributions of Greenland and Antarctica in the future, but Whichever ice sheet you're melting, um, tropical island nations kind of sit in a bullseye for uh, receiving more than the global average of sea level rise. Okay, so today we can actually measure what the relative contributions to sea level rise are or what the relative mass losses of Greenland and Antarctica using satellite measurements. Um, so right now, Greenland's losing ice at about twice the pace of Antarctica, um, but Antarctica, Antarctica will soon take over. Um, so let, let's jump into talking about the mechanisms for ice loss in each of those ice sheets. So there are, um, Gustav mentioned positive feedbacks um, in his last talk on permafrost, and so we also have positive feedbacks when it comes to ice sheet melting. Um, and in Greenland, there's, there's sort of two big ones. Um, the first is the melt albedo feedback. So the idea is as you melt ice on the surface of Greenland, you form meltwater, um, and that is darker in color than ice is. So incoming solar radiation uh, will reflect off of something that's bright white, like snow, but more of it will be absorbed um, by darker colored melt pools, and that further warms the ice sheet. So that's what we call a positive melt albedo feedback. Um, second is the height melt feedback. So Greenland, the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, I think is sitting about three kilometers above sea level, um, and you know we know from existing on the Earth, as you go up in altitude, it gets colder. So as Greenland melts and the elevation of the surface of the ice sheet drops, it's moving into a warmer and warmer, into warmer and warmer air temperatures, which again further 
uh, increases melting. And we're talking about thresholds. That's something you can't turn around on human time scales. Um, and so when we're trying to think about like when do we hit these thresholds um, where Greenland is going to start melting in a way that we can't turn it around, um, we use computer simulations. Um, so I know there are a lot of lines in that plot on the left, but it's, it's pretty simple. So what you're looking at uh, on the horizontal axis is time in thousands of years, starting from present on the left, moving to 10,000 years ago on the right. And on the vertical axis, you're showing the percent volume of the Greenland ice sheet you're losing over time. And so at the top, the two, what this modeler did is just increased air temperature above Greenland by two degrees Celsius and started the model and saw how the ice sheet would respond. Um, and you can see at two degrees of warming, there's sort of this really slow decline in ice volume. Again, not reversible, but it's slow. Um, and then there's this big step function increase moving from two degrees to four degrees. Um, and again, you know, losing all the ice volume over 10,000 years might not seem fast to you, but that's, that's quite rapid um, and leads to rates of sea level rise that are going to be tough to adapt to. I'm trying to think if there was another point here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the last point to make. So uh, the air above Greenland is actually warming at twice the pace of the global average. So don't think of this four degrees as four degrees of uh, global temperature increase. <laughs> All right, so Antarctica is a totally different beast with uh, different uh, feedback mechani mechanisms that are leading to its long-term retreat. Um, so the way we've come to understand uh, the way, sort of the mechanisms that, uh, and the timing that will lead to Antarctica's collapse is by looking into the past. So there are time periods in the past when we've had similar climates to today or similar levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as to today. It's, and so um, the person I'm standing in for, Rob DeCanto, what he's been um, really sort of instrumental in figuring out is tuning ice sheet models so that he can, he looks, combines geologic records with ice sheet models and has figured out how to incorporate um, physical processes that I'll be talking about in a minute into those ice sheet models in a way that they can reproduce sea levels we've seen during past warm periods. And then he's run those models into the future to come up with new, uh, ice sheet new projections for ice sheet contributions to sea level rise. Um, so this is Andrea Dutton from the University of Florida, standing on two shorelines from the last interglacial period. So we're in an interglacial period right now. There was an ice age which peaked about 20,000 years ago, and our last interglacial was around 100,000 years ago. And these old shorelines, they're sitting at eight meters above present day sea level. And CO2 is not even at 300 parts per million. To find uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide similar to what's in the atmosphere today, you have to go all the way back to the Pliocene, which is about 3 million years ago. Um, there are between 350 and 410 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, and sea level was between 6 and 30 meter meters higher than today. That's a big uncertainty range. Um, there's, I've, I've heard there's new work coming out that's narrowing that range to more like 16 to 30 meters. Okay, so I've mentioned that um, Greenland and Antarctica are very different from each other. <coughs> and that's pretty easy to sum up with this one picture. Um, so what you're seeing on the, on the left hand side Greenland on the top, Antarctica on the bottom, is a map of the elevation of the bedrock that Greenland and Antarctica are sitting on. So the big difference that jumps out is the bedrock that Greenland sits on is mostly above sea level. And so not much of the ice sheet is actually in contact with the ocean. Antarctica, on the other hand, there are areas two kilometers below sea level that have a grounded ice sheet sitting on top of them. And large... Uh, portions of the margin of that ice sheet are in direct contact with the ocean. Okay, so why is that important in terms of understanding mechanisms of ice sheet retreat? So it's sort of a, there are three mechanisms, it's kind of a, a three-stage process, just to give you the outline as I walk through it. First is ice shelf retreat, second is a marine ice sheet instability, and third is a marine ice cliff instability. So at the edges of Antarctica, 
the ice pinches out into what we call ice shelves, and those are floating pieces of ice. You know, as they melt, they're not going to contribute to sea level rise. They're they're already um, they're already floating. Um, but sort of what's interesting about them, so uh, they can melt from two directions. They can melt by warming from above and by coming into contact with warm ocean water um, on their underside. And what we've observed, you can see on the top left, the southern ocean is warming. And on the right, the red dots are showing places where these ice shelves are melting. Um, and we've observed this, actually, uh, in the last couple of decades. So this is uh, the Larsen B ice shelf in the northwestern part of Antarctica. Um, and in January 2002, these dark areas, which are actually pools of meltwater sitting on the surface, started to appear. And just a few months, a few months later, the whole thing broke up. OK, so I mentioned that these don't actually contribute to sea level rise. But the reason they're so important is that when this ice shelf broke up, the tributary behind it, the, so the glacier, that the ice that's grounded and does contribute to sea level rise, sped up by a factor of eight. And that's because these ice shelves provide a buttressing effect. Um, so as ice flows um, off of the Antarctic continent, these ice shelves, they, there's friction on their sides, they hit up against features on the ocean floor, and they actually hold the ice behind them back, the same way buttresses of a building do. Okay, so you melt an ice sheet, and then you're sort of exposed to this, uh, this second process called a marine ice sheet instability. Um, so as you move from the ice sheet, the, sorry, the floating ice shelf back towards land, you reach this area called the grounding line or the grounding zone, and that is where the ice sheet is in contact with bedrock. So I wish I had the, the topographic map of Antarctica up again, but you'll remember there are these deep bowls that are in the topography of Antarctica's bedrock. And so those slope from the edges downward into the middle of the ice sheet particularly in West Antarctica. So as that area, that region, the grounding zone, where the ice sheet becomes in contact with bedrock retreats, the, um, the height of the ice sheet above the grounding line increases. So because you're on this reverse slope bed, oop, as you march backwards, the thickness of the ice sheet above the grounding line gets bigger and bigger. OK. and so. What we care about is the relationship between that height and how fast ice moves across that grounding zone into the ocean where it's contributing to sea level rise. Um, don't worry about the details of that equation, but the important thing to notice is the number, uh, the number five. So that's saying that the relationship between ice flux, or sorry, the, the height of that area above the grounding zone and the flux or the movement of the ice through the grounding zone into the ocean, there's a power five relationship there. Um, and so this is zooming in on one of the outlet glaciers just behind the Larsen B ice shelf where I showed you the, uh, the collapse. And we observed a marine ice sheet instability for the first time when this happened in the early 2000s. And you can just see how rapidly that ice front retreated as soon as we got rid of the ice shelf and we exposed the grounding zone. Um, OK, so I mentioned there are three processes. We've covered ice, sheet break, or sorry, ice shelf breakup, marine ice sheet instability. Uh, the third is marine ice cliff instability. So um, what you can see here, at the new edge of the ice sheet is a cliff. Uh, and this is what these things look like um, up close. So as soon as you get rid of an ice shelf, um, when you get glacial ice directly flowing into the ocean, it usually ends in a cliff. Um, and so this ice has a finite material strength. So uh, when you load the top of it, eventually that load or that stress will exceed the material strength of ice, and you get collapse. All right, and here's a video of that happening. And that usually happens when the ice cliff exposed at the margin of the ice sheet is about 100 meters high. OK. 
All right, so here are those three processes again. Uh, first, ice shelf break ice shelf breakup, then rapid retreat of the grounding line, and to the fifth relationship, increase in ice flux into the ocean, which we call the marine ice sheet instability, um, and then exposing these 100 meter high cliffs to the ocean and getting ice basically failing, exceeding its material strength and collapsing, and that's the marine ice cliff instability. Okay, so again, Rob's big contribution has been incorporating these, this ice physics into ice sheet models. So the marine ice, ice shelf breakup, marine ice sheet instability, marine ice cliff instability. So he's gone back and simulated first climate during the last interglacial. So remember that's similar temperature to today. Um, and so focusing on the middle diagram, when he just adds in the marine ice sheet instability, he gets about 1.7 meters of sea level rise from the Antarctic continent. And then when he adds in the marine ice sheet instability and the marine ice cliff instability, he gets four meters of sea level rise. So you can see these processes have been really instrumental in reproducing observations of sea level from the past. And I'm, I'm gonna show the same figure just briefly, but from the Pliocene three million years ago when um, carbon dioxide was at 400-ish parts per million. Um, and same thing, adding the marine ice sheet instability gets three meters of sea level rise and adding both instabilities gets you 19, 20 meters of sea level rise. Okay, so then where it becomes relevant is you run these models into the future. Um, and so this is a 2016 paper that came out from, from Rob. Um, really sort of um, increasing sea level projections into the future, more than anything that we'd seen before we incorporated these instabilities into ice sheet models. Um, so the bottom figure is just showing out to 2100. You can see under um, RCP 8.5, that's sort of the business as usual emission scenario. We're getting almost a meter of sea level rise. Um, and when this came out, I think it was sort of marketed as a doomsday paper, but Rob takes a more optimistic view, which is this. Um, the difference between uh, following an RCP 2.6 pathway where there are big emissions cuts versus a business as usual RCP 8.5 pathway um, makes a really big difference in the amount of sea level rise we'll see in the future. So an important thing to point out, so even though Rob was a lead author, this is his study, he was a lead author on the SROC, um, these projections were not, or his exact model was not included in the SROC because it turns out um, he thinks he got the rate of warming over Antarctica not quite right. So he was warming Antarctica a little bit too fast, so these instabilities were kicking in a little bit too soon. Um, but nonetheless, here's what the SROC came up with. Um, the bottom plot is showing again, RCP 2.5 versus 8.6. And in 2100, we're getting 84 centimeters on average of sea level rise. In 2100, under RCP 2.6, 43 centimeters of sea level rise. Remember, 15 centimeters of sea level rise over the last 100 years, devastating impacts, already seeing 100-year floods annually in the tropical Pacific. Um, and again, there's a huge role that policy has to play in 2100 and especially moving out to 2300. Um, and this is just showing that the, uh, the SROC upped the sea level projections from the, AR, the IPCC AR5 report. It was the first time that the likely range, so under RCP 8.5, the pink shading uh, exceeded one meter of sea level rise in 2100. So an important thing to point out there, that that likely range, I think it's the, the top of it is the 84th percentile of what's possible. So this isn't even like the 95th or 99th percentile of what's possible. And we're already above one meter at 2100. All right, and I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I wanted to just clarify what you said about the thermal expansion of the, the water. Mm -hmm. So icebergs and, and ice shelves don't cause sea level rise when they melt because the water's already displaced, right? Exactly. Okay, so, but when they actually make, they can actually make a difference in the context of thermal expansion once they melt. 
Yeah, so actually, I but I don't know what the um, impact of that would be relative to all the other contributions, um, but I can ask and get back to I, you. I was just curious yeah. more, and if, it, and if that idea of thermal expansion is, you said it's different in different places around the globe because it's warmer in the tropics, et cetera. So yes. you would actually see like a different a difference mm -hmm. in thermal expansion. Is yes. That, is that okay? Um, and then I was also curious about um, you talked about the height um, feedback, uh, where the essentially the ice sheet um, elevation is lowering. Um, in does, Greenland, yeah. In Greenland. Mm -hmm. So does isostatic adjustment counteract any of that? I'm not an expert, but my hunch is that it's way too slow. Too we're, slow. We're, uh, like in Boston, we're still adjusting from the last, gla last glacial yeah. maximum 20,000 years ago. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for your very excellent presentation. Quite scaring, <laughs> I can say, of course. Um, uh, my question is, um, we have heard that uh, someone says that maybe we are still underestimating this probable sea level rise that we can have in the future. What do you think about it? Because uh, we have seen that maybe the first projection of the cone to the 2016 have been uh, maybe corrected, uh, reducing the amount of, of the speed of sea level rise. But uh, maybe there will be some bad news in the future, according to you, or not? Uh, so uh, do you believe that the, because the two projections of uh, the last report and the uh, error 5 uh, are quite similar? Do you think that it will remain also in the six assessment report, or maybe they will change? Um, keep an eye out for some papers coming out from Rob in the next year. Um, I don't, yeah, I think the long-term outlook is getting a bit worse as we get a better understanding, especially of the marine ice cliff instability. Um, what I don't know is if those change projections in 2100, but certainly, um, I mean, you saw the huge uncertainty going out to 2300. They just sort of like shift things within that range. And I can, um, I can give you a few more specifics on the stuff that's coming out later. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.
All right, hello everyone, and thanks to those of you who are tuning in online. Um, up next, we have Claire Stockwell and Andreas Gygus from Climate Analytics um, giving us an update on Climate Action Tracker. Hello. Thank you. Um, so welcome from our side. Uh, we are very happy to present you the, our last uh, update and especially a work we did in our current briefing. Uh, which is named the governments are uh, still showing little signs of acting on climate crisis. So um, I think the core expertise of the climate action tracker is the e uh, annual temperature update. Um, and with that we are tracking the effort of governments and the whole world towards uh, our Paris goals. Um, so we have three distinct uh, pathways. We have a current policy pathway where we uh, estimate uh, how current policies of governments are uh, acting on, on emissions. And for, for this uh, estimate of current policies, the current estimate of temperatures is 3 degrees with a range up to 4.1 degrees to 2.3. Um, this uh, range is basically composed of many parts, but the major are like climate uncertainty and another part is the uncertainty in the evaluation of the policies um, and in which emission they actually will result over the next century. 
The second is uh, the pledges and targets pathway. In this pathway, we uh, take into account additional um, the pledges of countries, so uh, what they put forward in the in the Paris uh, agreement. Um, and with that one, we get to a slightly lower temperature of 2.8. And the third one is a more optimistic pathway where we are uh, hope to include planned policy, which are not actually went through the government at all. And with that one, we actually go to the same temperature. Um, and of course, we are rounding to the first digit, because otherwise, uh, within all this uncertainty, it doesn't make sense. So there is the, the, the optimist pathway is a bit lower than actually the pledges pathway. But uh, we are hoping that in the future, there will be significantly more difference. Um, Another big part of the climate action tracker is actually assessment of countries and Claire will talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, so the second sort of major part of our briefing is we have updated our assessment of where countries stand in terms of their current policies uh, for most most of the 36 countries that we track. So I have up there on the slide the overview and as you can see, we have very few countries, unfortunately, that are in the 1.5 um, degree range in terms of where their NDCs would put them. Um, so those are the two, Gambia and Morocco at the top there. And then in the second column, we have whether or not they're on track to meet their targets. And we have about 14 countries that we think are on track and another six that are close, um, which is, of course, positive. But the thing to keep in mind there is that there are a large number of countries whose targets are very weak. So when we say that they're on track and they're overachieving, their targets are were weak to begin with, and so that um, what we would expect in the NDC update next year is a sort of strengthening um, of those targets. And you can find for those countries that are currently overachieving, if you go to our website, we've redone the calculations of what their NDC, like in the language of their NDC, how much further do they have to go based on the um, uh, based on the, the amount that they're overachieving now, so that you could really have that uh, little bit of a cheat sheet to see when they update the NDC, is that a real true progression of ambition, or were they just taking uh, the, the sort of amount that they're already overachieving and on a track for those targets and just strengthening, uh, just changing the numbers of their NDC that way. Um, in addition to this overview and the sort of general update on all the countries, we have in this round added four new countries to the Climate Action Tracker, which are the UK, Germany, Kenya, and uh, Vietnam. This was the first time we have for a long time tracked the EU as a whole, but this was the first time that we were able to actually break it down and look at two um, EU countries. I won't propose to go into these countries uh, in detail, except to say maybe a few points on each of them. Um, the United Kingdom here, we because obviously at the moment, and that uh, we may know more at the end of today, uh, they are still within the, the EU. We are ranking their national target as opposed to their NDC, and we would rank that national target as it stands as insufficient. Um, they do have, when you look at their, they are not on track at the moment to meet their fourth and fifth carbon budgets. And so while in the past they had significant uh, policy developments with with the 20, uh, 2008 climate change law, there has really been a dearth of climate policy since then, which is then means that now they're potentially at risk of, of meeting these targets. So that as the sort of incoming presidents for COP26 next year, we would really expect a substantial wrapping up in terms of their policies to get them back on track for their own targets. And then as well, one of the other positive things that they did was legislate over the summer for a net zero target, but they have yet to put forward all of the concrete plans and measures there to be able to, to meet that target. So if we move on to uh, Germany, again, this is rating the national target as opposed to the European NDC. And there we would rate Germany's target highly insufficient. We think that they are not on track to meet even that target. Um, and while they have had a series, the uh, climate and energy package um, that was adopted in September has a number of very important and positive structural elements in terms of phasing out coal, putting a price on carbon in, in certain sectors. It doesn't go far enough in terms of the actual uh, measures to reduce emissions. So we think there's still a lot of work uh, to be done there. 
um, on Kenya, a uh, little bit more of a positive story. Their uh, NDC we rate as two degrees compatible. Um, but the thing, the sort of key message about Kenya or the key takeaway is right now I believe their uh, installed electricity capacity is 85% renewable, but they're considering building two new coal plants. And that is not consistent with the global benchmark, um, which uh, one of which is, is um, Chinese funded and built, and these would be the first coal plants in East Asia. These are not compatible with the uh, global uh, benchmarks, nor the, the benchmarks for East Africa of phasing out uh, coal by 2040. Um, so that we would hope that they would uh, reconsider their plans on coal um, and making sure that uh, from a global perspective, supporting them to uh, continue down the renewable energy path rather than building these coal plants and, and risking uh, having stranded assets. And then the final country that we added to the analysis was uh, Vietnam. Here, their NDC is rated as critically insufficient, but you can see what I was mentioning earlier, that countries that have, uh, they will, they are on track quite significantly to overachieve that NDC, but that's because the NDC was weak to begin with. Um, on the positive standpoint, we know that the government is currently preparing its revision um, and hopes to update it, its NDC. Again, here, uh, the, Vietnam has a significant coal fleet and a significant amount of its energy. Uh, it derives its energy now from coal, but I think m uh, even more concerning is its plans to expand that possibly by 2030, 50% of its electricity capacity would come from coal, uh, which again is not consistent with the global phase out um, dates for coal that we need to remain with 1.5 degree compatible. So that is our, the, our sort of update uh, for our countries and the new countries that we added. I guess the final thing that I would mention is, like, we got the question the other day, you know, the, the, why are some countries rated the same when you look at their, the, the action within those countries, you would think that there would need to be a difference. And there was, the question was put forward on Australia and um, the UK both having an insufficient rating, whereas uh, Australia has not done a lot in terms of it doesn't have a 2050 target, it doesn't have an advisory committee like the Committee on Climate Change, which the UK has. And so what we also have done recently is tried to expand uh, the types of things that we look at in the tracker. And so we've added um, a climate governance series that would specifically look at these elements uh, we developed a framework looking at four broad areas across political commitment, institutional structure, policy processes, and stakeholder engagements where we would pick up on those, do you have a, a, a comprehensive climate change legislation, do you have a Paris compatible long-term goal, do you have an advisory committee, have you sufficiently uh, an effective coordination mechanism between ministries both across sectors and with sub-national actors, and to try and sort of uh, expand our analysis to reflect at a little bit more granular level the countries. Um, in this first round, we've rolled it out to six countries, Australia, um, Argentina, Indonesia, Kenya, the Philippines, and South Africa. Um, so I would encourage you, we have all of the country profiles for these up on our websites, and that's just our attempt to further, in addition to tracking the policies in place, the temperature projections, rating based on an equity framework, where the NDC is, this is just uh, f filling out the picture of where we think countries are on that trajectory to um, to decarbonize. And with that, I will hand it back to Andreas. So basically there is significant more work to do and I think everybody knows the emissions gap, uh, which is even filed in uh, big reports like the emission gap report. Um, and then de depending on what goal of temperature you are aiming for 1.5, there is significant discrepancy between wh what we, what uh, governments are pledging to do and what we actually need to do. And so we thought of we need another way of guiding uh, the global community where we actually need to go and how we need to translate um, a temperature goal in an actual NDC uh, target for 2030. Um, and so we did a study what is actually how we connect NDC, uh, the NDCs with our targets and we started from the, the current NDC trajectory. So this is basically the emission pathway for the world which we are heading when all states would implement their current NDCs. And as in the temp uh, with the thermometer you would see that we are ending up at 2.8 degrees which nobody of us actually wants. So now we uh, 
go through different scenarios, uh, which we call like a minimal and an incremental increase of NDCs, which basically will result in a 10% reduction or a 20% reduction of emissions in 2030 compared to this baseline. And then uh, we went through the same methodology as the CAT um, going and then we see that with that we are lowering the temperature to about 2.4 or 2.2 in the 20% uh, case. Uh, and of course we need more on the way and therefore we added another uh, two scenarios being reduction of 35% and 50% and then finally with the 50% reduction if governments would implement that goal and we would actually also follow this trajectory. This is very important. Like, current policy is like now facing, uh, like looking at 2030 and 2050, but of course, if you're setting targets and you achieve them, you also need to stay in the same ambition over the, after the second half of the century. And then finally, with that one, we can actually reach 1.5 if governments will achieve to implement these targets. And also you can see that actually the time is uh, precious, so as longer we wait, the more we actually would need to to increase in ambition. Um, and since this is basically the most important process, uh, we also choose to actually track this process of updating NDCs more closely. So we launched uh, last week or the week before the climate target update tracker, which will specifically focus on NDCs, so we try to have like a rapid analysis on new NDCs. So as soon as the government is putting out a target, we, we decided not to wait for like an annual update, but we, we hope then in a very short time frame um, to put that then on our website and then do an analysis of the NDC so that people can refer to our website. Uh, currently, we have only like t uh, one country who s submitted an NDC, which is uh, Mongolia, and we know from Chile that they are um, in the process of uh, um, submitting one. And then uh, also we found it important that we have countries who already announced that they will not bring up a new NDC. So this, these are the countries here in the middle, which is Australia, Japan, and USA. Um, and I think it's it's important for people to know that they are actually not in line with the whole Paris process uh, and actually also announced that. And just as an example, uh, we did a small assessment of the Chilean NDC, um, which uh, is quite complicated, but you can separate it in an in a uh, in unconditional pledge, which will, would improve their uh, climate action tracker rating from highly insufficient to insufficient. And then there is a more vague uh, conditional NDC, uh, and if you would go through this assessment, we would actually rate them as Paris comp uh, Agreement compatible. But I think they are on the way on clarifying more on, on the exact terms. And then, of course, uh, we thought about what is actually a good NDC, that it has, for example, a fixed target, uh, it, it defined at zero um, year, and of course the whole economy should be covered because a lot of NDCs are currently co covering only a part of the gases and only parts of the sectors. And of course we want to have this shaded area as small as possible because need, countries need to do their target for all the sectors and not ex exclude, for example, the most important sectors. And with that, I think we are done by presenting and happy to answer all your questions. Any questions? <laughs> uh, thanks so much. When you're calculating um, the compatibility of countries with Paris, are you assuming that in the future they're going to account for the same percentage of global emissions? Um, no, I think not. We are actually only um, assessing the 2030 target and also sometimes in a deeper analysis the current policy. So only for, for this one year, but we, 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 for the in, if you go to the country profiles, you have actually like a corridor where we continue this kind of rating over t until 2050. So you would see, okay, if countries bring forward the 2050 goal, um, how this would be rated. But the current prominent rating, we only do for 2030. 
Or actually, maybe a better way to ask it is like, it, since temperature is a temperature increase is a global thing, but each country only accounts for a portion of it. Yes. How are you, like, saying how compatible how compatible they are with this global phenomenon? Like, is it per capita or? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, no, it's not per capita. It's actually it's actually maybe the most complicated question you can ask. Um, Sorry. No worries. Um, no, there's a lot of literature about that. Like, actually, we have this budget and how we actually fairly split this budget. And there are numerous approaches per capita, historic responsibility, capability of countries, basically based on what they can afford in money terms, and I guess a lot of more. And there was a lot of discussion about that, but basically the Climate Action Tracker decided to be more or less didn't try to judge all these approaches, so we are, we actually compute all the different approaches, so we get a, a huge range of what what the literature and studies consider to be fair, and from this whole range, um, we actually then um, try to split this pie according to like the full range. So we remove, for example, outliers, and then we have what we call an equity range of a country. Um, which, like the literature say, if, if the countries would do that, um, we, we, we are coming up to 2 degree or 1.5. But actually you can envision if every country will choose its um, the, the tailored approach which is most beneficial for, for the country, and all are doing like the worst choice, we are not actually coming to 1.5. So we actually need to reassess and lower all the ambition for all the countries. So we make sure that actually all the countries on this fair share split, so the split is basically fixed, but the actual level we reduce back that we are actually coming at two degrees and 1.5. Awesome, thank you. That was great. Um, I really wanted to thank you for this. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can go back to the slide that was showing the um, potential model runs. There, there this one. Um, because, of course, what we're talking about today, because of the release of the, the Cryosphere 1.5 report, is very much that 1.5 you know, guardrail for cryosphere. And it's interesting to me that the, the transformational, as well as significant, the two um, cat countries versus all countries really diverges for transformational. And I'm wondering if you can say why that might be. Okay, um, so, like you're, yeah, very good observation. Like the, 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 the emission lines converge much more. And I think it's basically um, what we, this is only the global picture. And underlying in the whole CAT, um, we are actually separating the different uh, big regions. And there are some regions with more developing countries and more developed countries. And, and we are using this, the, the basically we are using the data from the integrated assessment models, which are covering all that regions and they have different ambition for different regions. And if you lower basically uh, that one for different regions, um, you first go with um, the developing countries, uh, the developed countries um, to reduce emissions. And then at some point, you, when you're getting close to zero, actually every country needs to chip in so basically then you're all the remaining for example developing countries if we talk about equity um, there are countries who, who are still allowed to increase in their emissions because they claim to they need that for their development so all that you actually then at some point in time you need, need also to get rid of that to actually go to the to the for example zero emissions in, in the countries so basically the message is the big emitters need to um, step in first, and then the others need really to follow to actually go to 1.5. Um, what's the dip in global emissions at like 2011 or 2012? Sorry again. So in the black line, there's a little, it's the one year it looks like where global emissions decreased, uh, 2012 maybe? See in the black line all the way on the left. Do you have any idea what that's about? I. Oh, sorry. It's before 2010. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Do we have any more questions? No? Well, thank you so very much. That was really informative, yeah. Great to get an update on this. <laughs> So in about eight minutes, we will uh, summarize the Chrysler 1.5 degree report and start repeating the talks we had this morning. Uh, plus one new one. Uh, yeah, Arctic sea ice, that's right. Yeah, that's going to be great.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us here at the Cryosphere Pavilion. And for those of you who are watching online, good afternoon as well. Thank you for being here. So today is a big day here at the Cryosphere Pavilion because at the ICCI, we are releasing a new report, which is called the Cryosphere 1.5 report. So you can find this important report on our website on iccinet.org slash cryosphere15. So make sure you do download the report and take a look at it. So to start the afternoon, I have the honor to introduce Pam Pearson, who is the director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative, and she will give us a summary of the Cryosphere 1.5 report. Pam, the floor is yours. And um, before she leaves, we really want to be thanking uh, Dr. Heidi Silvestre, who has been very much emceeing during this week. Unfortunately, she needs to leave us um, to begin returning perhaps to her glaciers. Um, but we hope to welcome her back again next year, uh, assuming a Cryosiever Pavilion in Glasgow. Thank so you thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Beth. Bye-bye. Safe travels. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I'm going to do a rapid gallop then through the Cryosphere 1.5 report. This is a consensus report. Uh, there was a, a sense that it was really, um, it would be really helpful for governments and policymakers to bring together the results of the special report by the IPCC on 1.5 degrees, which did not have any special brief to focus on cryosphere and actually did not have that many cryosphere scientists engaged simply because they were all off working on the special report on oceans and cryosphere, which came out this past September. Um, and that, on the other hand, did not have a charge to look at cryosphere specifically between 1.5 and 2 degrees the way the SR 1.5 did. So we wanted to bring those two things together because there's a sense in the cryosphere community that um, there's not an appreciation in the policy world of how important this gradient between where we are today at 1 degree and what will happen not just at 1.5 but at 2 degrees. In other words, that half degree in global mean temperature between 1.5 and 2 may not seem very important, but it's incredibly important when you're talking about cryosphere regions. The Earth really undergoes a state change in many ways between 1 degree and 2 degrees, and we wanted to outline that so that as countries leave Madrid and COP25, and go back to determine what their 2020 NDCs are going to be, which really is a process that's going to be, if they're following the Paris Agreement, between the next three to six months, actually. They're supposed to be reported well before COP26, still so that there's a, a better awareness of why this gradient is important and what kinds of changes we're committing the globe to if we allow that to go further. So I'm going to, as I said, run through some of the major findings, and then there are individual presentations on all of these uh, throughout the day today. These are the cryosphere thresholds that we focus on. There are other thresholds. There are certainly non-cryospheric thresholds in the global climate system, but these are the ones, that, uh, as I said, that undergo this kind of state change in the temperature range where we find ourselves right now and which we're contemplating. Uh, permafrost thaw has been ongoing for quite some time, and it's going to continue uh, as we go through two, three at higher temperatures. The West Antarctic ice sheet probably tipped sometime around 0 0.8 degrees. I'll talk more about that. Mountain glaciers are all losing mass. That's going to continue. Uh, Arctic sea ice, of course, has been declining. That's one of the most well-known impacts of climate change and one of the most visible. The ice sheets of Greenland and also East Antarctica are uh, undergoing mass loss at this point. Um, and polar ocean acidification, we're actually already seeing signs of this, especially in some of the seas around the Arctic. That is anticipated to continue, and that's an extremely important threshold that I'll talk about later. But starting now with the uh, mountain glaciers, the tropical glaciers, so these are the uh, equatorial glaciers, I think you'd say, the northern Andes, East Africa, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea actually have some small glaciers. Those are going to be lost under all emission scenarios. You'll preserve a bit more at 1.5, especially of high altitude glaciers, say above 6,000 meters. But um, 
in essence, those are lost right now. And I think that's an important message in terms of seeing that, that what we humans have done already to the climate system. But as you move to the mid-latitudes, you begin to see a lot of divergence and, in a, in a sense, a sign of hope that if we are able to keep temperatures at 1.5 degrees, which are the blue lines in these graphs, in places like the southern Andes, that includes Patagonia, uh, the Rockies in the U.S., Scandinavia, New Zealand, and uh, above all, maybe Central Europe and the Alps, you really see a big difference based on what emissions uh, we follow between now and the end of this century. And uh, the blue lines are a low emissions scenario that gets us around 1.5 degrees and then slight declines thereafter. And uh, especially in places like the Alps, for example, you even see a little bit of regrowth going on. And so 1.5 degrees for these mid-latitude glaciers is in essence the difference between some ice preserved and no ice left at all. Iceland, for example, uh, we had a presentation from Iceland earlier this week. At two degrees, they, Iceland will have no more ice. And so here again, that's a really striking difference between 1.5 and 2. If you move to the higher latitudes, there's a lot of impacts as well. High latitude, primarily Arctic and to some degree also Antarctic Peninsula glaciers, and high altitude, in other words, uh, the Himalayas. You reduce losses quite a bit at 1.5 degrees. About a third of glaciers in that region will, will still be lost. There was a paper that came out just a couple of days ago that talked about 2.2 billion that are impacted uh, by water runoff from glaciers and snow in this region. But uh, at two degrees, it's about a 50% loss. And at very high emission scenarios, you're looking at about two thirds loss. So, in other words, if we reach around four degrees at the end of the century, then even these glaciers are losing quite a bit of mass. Uh, polar oceans, as I spoke about earlier, they uh, have much greater levels of acidic acidification at uh, 2 degrees as opposed to 1.5. The, the bad news there, again, is that we're already seeing some shell damage. That's anticipated to spread uh, first in the Arctic Ocean, and then later on, the Southern Ocean around Antarctica will come into play. Uh, it lags a bit behind the Arctic. And uh, what you see here is the difference between 1.5 degrees, where you have some fairly severe impacts in parts of the Arctic Ocean. By the time you get to four degrees in a high emission scenario uh, with higher levels of CO2, the acidification is widespread in both polar oceans. These are really important fisheries looking forward. And uh, this is only one of the impacts that you see from uh, CO2 emissions and global warming because at the same time as this acidification is happening, think that the waters are warming. These polar species are not adapted to that. You have southerly or, well, you have more mid-latitude species coming polewards uh, that are competing with those that are at the poles. And you also have a lot of freshening going on because they're losing so much from the ice sheet. So really big state changes in the water. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the loss of sea ice that also will have an impact. But acidification is a really important threshold because it takes 50 to 70,000 years to buffer that higher acidity out. So it is a very irreversible on human time scales impact of the CO2 already in the atmosphere. Permafrost is a huge difference between one degree where we are today, where as you can see from this slide, we've already lost quite a bit at one degree. Um, it feeds back into the climate system through CO2. An important message from this report is that once permafrost thaws, it continues emitting carbon for a very long time, two to 300 years. And so one of the things we talk about in the report, especially as we get to higher levels of uh, loss, is that you need to think about it as kind of a new NDC, almost a new country. Uh, because at about 1.5 degree, the emissions from permafrost over time will be about the size of those from a country such as Canada today. If we go to two degrees, those emissions will be somewhere on the scale of the European Union today over time. If we go even higher to four degrees, permafrost becomes a super emitter. Uh, the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere will be about equal to a China or a United States. But again, the important message being that what this commits us to, if we allow this permafrost to thaw, 
is negative emissions. In other words, even if all of the human emissions were able to be taken down to zero, say by 2050, we're going to have to offset the permafrost carbon emissions that are going to continue going into the atmosphere for a couple of hundred years after this, making it, again, a really important intergenerational issue. And one of the things that uh, is not in the Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere are these abrupt thaw processes. These are papers that are just coming out right now. And uh, what happens is that, especially with uh, uh, heat waves, which are increasingly happening in the Arctic, you get abrupt thaw, you get cliffs forming or shallow lakes suddenly forming, and these processes then reach more permafrost than would have been reached otherwise. And an important aspect of these abrupt thaw processes is that more methane is released also. So you're getting greater thaw and you're getting more emissions in the form of methane, which is more of a superheating greenhouse gas. And so in the near term, you get a lot more uh, of a punch of warming from that. And so here again, keeping temperatures down is a way to constrain that. Sea ice is very well established to follow along the lines of CO2 emissions, but one of the, the newer things in this report that should be reflected in the next IPCC assessment report in 2021 is that if you take the models and you calibrate them more to observations, because global uh, models have not been good at capturing sea ice loss. They're always lagging behind. Uh, the estimate is that, and again, we need to think not in terms of years, because that's often the kinds of questions that sea ice scientists get. When is the ice going to disappear? Um, the real issue, again, is temperature. It's very closely tied to temperature. And probably starting around 1.7 degrees is when you're going to see an ice-free Arctic Ocean at some point during the summer, even for a few days or a few weeks. But what this graph is trying to represent very cleverly, where you see the, the open water on here, is by two degrees, that ice-free period is going to stretch perhaps from July to October most years. And um, that is not good news, even if those conducting shipping might think it is, because then you get a much darker ocean that's absorbing more heat. Uh, it's going to be hotter than in winter, too, of course, even if it freezes over again, but it will be warmer. And uh, it'll be absorbing more heat from the sun all summer now, which then leads to more Greenland ice melt, for example, leads to more permafrost thaw. And so you get these really cascading feedbacks. And so we really want to protect the sea ice. And again, the only way really to do that is to um, work to keep CO2 emissions below 1.5 so that we're able to maintain at least some amount of sea ice. Um, one thing that has already happened is loss of multi-year sea ice. This is thick ice, and this is showing uh, sea ice that is four meters or more beginning in the 1980s. And as you can see, if you look in the upper left of this uh, animation, it is going down from originally being about a third of all sea ice, around 3 million square kilometers. And uh, you see a deep dip in 2007. That was a record year. And then in 2012, you'll see another dip. That was another record year. And uh, since then, it's been down essentially to zero in the summer each year. So we just don't have any really thick multi-year sea ice left. And that is really important because of this. The, the, um, there's a lot of talk about loss of coral reefs. In the Arctic, multi-year ice serves the same purpose. It's a very rich environment. It's not dead at all. And it's the basis of the food chain. Having that multi-year ice it is important in all sorts of ways. Um, and once you lose that, you lose that ecosystem. And so there's a fear, again, especially when you take that together with freshening of water and together with growing levels of acidification, that we're going to see a complete ecosystem collapse at higher temperatures, maybe even already at 1.5 degrees, but certainly by two. And so again, we need to keep temperatures low. And finally, moving on to the ice sheets. Um, this is looking at new estimates based on a reinterpretation of satellite data of when you're going to see annual flood events that formerly were, were thought of as 100-year events in certain places in the world. This is uh, a map of Tianjin uh, near Beijing. 
And as you can see, basically the entire city is going to be subject to flooding on an annual basis by 2050, even under all admission scenarios. So even at one degree. And this is Bangladesh together with the Kolkata region of India. And here again, uh, annual flood events that would have been thought of as 100 year events, even at one degree or a bit above by 2050. Some of this is coming from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And as I said earlier, uh, scientists have a growing consensus that it probably tipped into irreversible collapse sometime before 2015, maybe around 0 0.8 degrees. Um, the important aspect of this though is even if that collapse is inevitable and that holds maybe four meters of sea level rise as those glaciers that you see in the red here really start flowing into the southern ocean um, that we can really slow that process of collapse down away from maybe a couple of hundred years if we go to higher temperatures it may take centuries or thousands of years for that water to enter the system and then again to lead to three to four meters of sea level rise so it's a huge difference dealing with four meters of sea level rise over two thousand years as opposed to over two hundred years and staying as close as we can to 1.5 is going to help with that um, one way to think about sea level rise is to move away from the models and move to what we do know, which is what sea levels were in Earth's past at similar levels of temperature. And this is work by Andrea Dutton, who uh, just won a MacArthur Genius Award, actually, for the work that she's done in mapping this all over the world. And as you can see, already where we are today, uh, the Earth in the past was about six to nine meters. It had, had sea levels six to nine meters higher than today. Um, once you move into somewhere between one and two degrees, six is again sort of a basis, but up to 13 is what we've seen in the past. But again, the, the big news is once the Earth moves into a state of between two and three degrees, it's uh, anywhere from 12 to the, the new estimate from Andrea actually for more sites is now closer to 25 meters of sea level rise. Um, now this is, of course, constant temperatures over a long period of time, but the message we're trying to give here, because countries are talking about, okay, what is our, what is our goal, what is our long-term goal going to be? Two degrees is way too high. Uh, if we stayed at two degrees for a long period of time, we will see massive sea level rise. But even at 1.5 degrees, you're going to see quite a bit of sea level rise if we stay there over time. And so what we hear from the paleoclimatologists working on ice sheets is one degrees is actually the new 1.5 degrees. In other words, if you're trying to determine what a new stable temperature for the Earth can be that's going to allow an Earth that we know to persist, we really need to treat 1.5 as a guardrail and get temperatures back down to one degree as soon as we can thereafter. And this is representing this, again, for, for cryosphere 2100, and focus on 2100 is really way too early because it takes a long time to respond, but once it does, it can respond in very extreme ways. And this is the role for policy here. So the black line on the bottom is uh, basically 1.5 degrees, RCP 2.6, and you're going to see a very long, slow process of sea level rise there. Um, but as you move to high emission scenarios, by 2500, we're looking at around 15 meters of sea level rise. And uh, again, that's, that's less than 500 years from today. But we can prevent that from happening if we stay at these lower temperature levels. And so hopefully this is a message more of hope. Um, but also urgency that the 2020 NDCs really are key in determining what kind of planet we're going to see in the future. Um, there's more detail in the um, Cryosphere 1.5 report. It's available online. And uh, I, and I would say all of the scientists who worked on the report, um, over 40, many of them IPCC authors, are uh, quite happy to answer questions in the course of the day. Thank you so much. And our next uh, presentation, I believe, is on 2 p.m. Mountains, mountain glaciers and snow.
Uh, we'll have actually two presentations from two of the authors slash reviewers working on this report, first on mountain glaciers and then on snow. Snow is often something that's kind of forgotten in discussions of uh, mountain areas, but snowpack actually provides more water resources than glaciers. And so it's an important aspect of the climate system. And one of the findings of the SROC is that not only are glaciers receding, but so is snow cover. So um, please come back at two. And if there are any questions now, I'm happy to answer them. My question is about the Pliocene climate and the levels of the sea levels that were reconstructed from the Pliocene. Um, given that it must have been slower warming over a longer period of time, how, um, or is there like an understanding of how long it took for sea levels to reach 12 to 20 meters in that time period? There isn't, except that it would have been very slow. But the, the interesting there, thing there is that this was in response to very small orbital changes uh, in, in the, the, you know, it, the Earth. And so those would have been very slight perturbations that became more over time. Um, one of the interesting aspects of that that I actually just learned about this week also is that a lot of this, these changes in sea level rise happened at one pole at a time at the time. Right, because th these were orbital changes, and you so you would have either an Antarctica or the Arctic more face towards the sun, and therefore you get more um, melting on one or the other, but not both at the same time. Today, both those ice sheets are reacting. Uh, you're having six more, six times more ice loss uh, from Greenland than. Under the 20th century, I think the benchmark is probably 1980. Uh, and Antarctica is two times. So this time we know that both poles are reacting at the same time. And so it's probably going to be different. And sea level can rise very quickly. At the end of the last ice age, over about a 300 year period, sea levels rose between uh, 12 and 14 meters. Now that was from the, the, the disintegration of the Laurentian ice sheet, but it went that quickly. And uh, we're not, you know, sure that something similar could not happen, especially on Antarctica. Because, I mean, Antarctica is basically an archipelago. So once it starts going, there's, there's a lot of ice there that, that, in essence, would be below sea level and, and be subject, it's grounded below sea level. And so it would be subject to uh, rapid collapse, potentially. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, what does it mean to have a paleo-calibrated climate model? I think you showed it in one of the earlier I slides. She's better. So trying to understand the way ice sheets are, it feels funny to talk, I'm like talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll look up here, that's yeah. weird. <laughs> okay. um, so trying to understand how ice sheets are going to respond to climate forcing in the future. Um, a lot of what goes into that is understanding uh, physical processes on the ice sheet. Um, and in order to sort of make sure we're representing those physical processes correctly in models, um, we go to past periods of time when we know um, what carbon dioxide forcing was, what temperature forcing was, and what sea level was. And we run the model backwards and kind of use that to sort of try and adjust the physical processes in the model um, to make sure they can at least reproduce past climate. And that's what paleo-calibrated means. And then you, then you know you can run them forward reliably. So an example is like um, when, oh sorry, when ice sheets retreat and you end up with cliffs um, on the edge of a grounded ice sheet, they eventually will collapse, kind of collapse under their own weight. Um, so the downward stresses exceed the material strength of the ice. And that's a, that's a sort of tough thing to represent in models. So you can sort of like run backwards to make sure you're representing it well when you run it forwards. Okay. And I just want to say that Hannah is one of the early career scientists who've been volunteering at the pavilion throughout the COP. Um, and she's actually the only one remaining right now, but it's one of the, been one of the richest things that we've had these two weeks is having them here as a resource.
Thank you very much. First of all, Pam, for all the work you have done to bring this together here and let us know, let us understand what is going on. Very, very much thank you. These are, again, very shocking news, uh, especially with the mountain glaciers that are, seems already lost. I was aware that we have will, with the melting of sea ice and the melting of the cryosphere, the sea level will rise. We will have more and more extreme weather events, especially in the tropics and highly populated coastal areas. This means uh, contamination of freshwater reservoirs with uh, salt water. This means a shortage of uh, fresh water for drinking. Now the glaciers are lost too. Th then there will, where does the fresh water come from? How many? We, there was a report released on dead zones in the ocean. What are we, must we have to talk about dead zones in terrestrial areas because a lack of fresh water? How many people will be affected? How many areas may become inhabitable? In what time frame? So in order to be prepared for the people who cannot, who have to leave their, their home there. Uh, yeah. What do we face? Well, I mean, that, that of course is, our focus here is mitigation. Obviously, though, we're going to have to adapt to some level of climate change. But I think the focus we're trying to keep here, um, that adaptation people share, is that adaptation is being planned and can be planned for, say, 1.5 degree scenarios, even 2 degree scenarios. These high emission scenarios, humanity just can't adapt to. Um, and so that is where the breaking point really comes. Um, and so definitely planning for 1.5 and how to adapt for that is going to be very important. But we can't kid ourselves that we can allow for large overshoot, three or four degrees, and be able to adapt to that, especially because of the cryosphere response. We simply have to bring down emissions. Okay, there, there is already a great loss and damage in, a one, uh, mm -hmm. in our real world going yeah. on in equatorial regions, in tropical regions, not only with regard, uh, especially with regard to, to uh, fresh water. So um, we have to face this already. We, this is not only a question of adaptation, but also a question of loss and damage and of... Uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> yeah. That's less a question and more a statement of reality. Yeah. So I want to um, allow our next presenter on uh, mountain glaciers to have ample time to also hook up her computer. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll repeat this uh, summary one last time at the very end of the day. Alaska and Fairbanks, and I was also a coordinating lead author in the IPC report, and I will uh, present some of those results from the ESROP report. So glaciers, will there be any in 100 years? <clears throat> the answer is yes, but it depends a little bit where you are. So the points I want to make in this talk is that glaciers around the world have lost and will lose substantial ice volume by the end of the century. Many glaciers will disappear in the world, and this glacier wastage has impacts on people, impacts on sea level, stream flow, hazards, landscapes, cultural values. 
Um, we heard a lot about the ice sheets before here. Ice sheets are losing mass and also increasingly losing mass. But this talk is only about all the glaciers outside the ice sheets, shown here in blue, including those around Greenland and Antarctica, but all the mountain glaciers in the world. That's 200,000 glaciers in the world. They cover an area of 700,000 square kilometers, which is the size of Texas or the size of the UK and Spain together. Um, if you melt all glaciers and dump the water into the ocean, the sea level equivalent is about 40 centimeters. That doesn't sound very much, but even though those glaciers only make up 1% of all ice volume in the world, Antarctica and Greenland is much, much bigger, they are substantial contributors to sea level rise at the moment. These glaciers, they contribute more to sea level rise than the entire Greenland, uh, Antarctic ice sheet at the moment and roughly about as much as the Greenland ice sheet at the moment. So even though there's not a, a lot of mass at the moment, volume, the contribution to sea level rise is substantial. So how have glaciers changed in the past? And um, during the last 100 years, a massive retreat in glaciers you see it all over the world. So the glaciers are really visible signs of cl climate change. Here, over the last 50 years, there's a lot of photos here in Alaska. I mean, a massive retreat here at Moore Glacier in Alaska. But you can go anywhere in the world. Here in the tropics, massive changes. Um, this glacier here, Chakaltaya, has disappeared by now. Um, uh, Tanzania, Kilimanjaro, just in a few years here, like seven years. And what is really striking is that now you see changes um, over just a few years. So this is here in Switzerland, over just eight years, this glacier has changed tremendously, just in the last years. And that's very striking that we see rapid changes really from one year to another. Another example here, Finderland Glacier, also eight years, a massive change in the landscape and the retreat of the glacier in just eight years. So when we look at all glaciers in the world, this is a figure from the S-Rock report, chapter two, of aggregated the mass changes for 11 mountain regions. What you see, the black line, is the mass change every single year, how much the glacier is losing mass. The gray is the uncertainty. And then there's also some other estimates that we could find in the literature superimposed on that, but that is multi-year averages from, for instance, the satellite GRACE and other estimates. So when you look at this, it looks busy. And that is because there's a lot of interannual variability. You can have glaciers um, um, gaining mass for a year or two or three. And this is what you see. In some regions, you have periods where the glaciers gain mass because there's just a lot of precipitation or it's a cold summer. But overall, when you look at the broad picture, in all these regions, the glaciers are increasingly losing mass. The other main message is it's really different in different regions. So this co coherent pattern of mass loss you see around the world, but for instance, um, the mass loss here in high mountain Asia on average is less than in the European Alps. Here, the units, 1,000 here, kilograms per square meter means the glaciers are thinning a meter per year. So European Alps and Southern Andes, a meter per year on average over all glaciers um, uh, during the last years. Um, what you see, this map in the middle shows the area average, sort of the averages for all these regions. In red, you see um, the mass loss in kilograms per square meter per year, averaged over this period here, 2006 to 2015. And that is an, an indicator for the average thinning. And that depends on climate, on temperature. So the average thinning rates are highest in the world in the European Alps, in the Caucasus, Pyrenees, in, uh, in Patagonia. But the sea level contribution, of course, also depends not only how much is it thinning, but how much ice there is on the area. It's essentially the thinning times the area. And that's why Alaska is not thinning as much as Europe, but the sea level contribution is much, much larger. So the mass change really regionally, it depends what you're interested in, in the thinning rates, or if you're interested in sea level rise, um, you get a very, very different picture. So why do glaciers retreat? The main driver is air temperature. That's the main driver. 
um, precipitation increases in some regions, a little bit more snowfall, but that does not set off the changes due to increased temperature. And here's a study running a model with natural and anthropogenic forcing, only natural forcing, not too much difference in the earlier period, but starting at around 1960, it really diverges. And between 1991 and 2010, um, this study um, calculates that almost 70% of the glacier changes are attributed to um, anthropogenic causes. So, there's a summary here. So glaciers are losing mass worldwide due to climate change and in particular to warming. Um, often there, there are some glaciers that are advancing and they get a lot of media attention, but those are the absolute exception. The vast majority, 99.999% of the glaciers are losing mass and retreating. And these advances are unrelated, mostly unrelated to climate, but have to do with glacier dynamic mechanisms that are unrelated to climate. So how will the glaciers change in the future? And the projections are, just to remind everybody about the scenarios, the projections are often made for here the RCP scenarios. RCP 2.6 is a low emission scenario, 8.5 a high emission scenario, and how that translates here to 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees you see here in this table also from the SROC report. So RCP 2.6 is sort of close to the 1.5 scenario. This is projections of all glaciers in the world by the end of the century. Um, essentially all models and simulations that are available in the literature over the last 10 years. And you see for the low emission scenario, mass losses of about 18%. Um, for the high emission scenario, about 36%. So that means the glaciers are losing substantial mass worldwide. But by the end of the century, there's still a lot of ice left that means they will contribute, contribute to sea level rise. But um, if you translate that in sea level equivalent, by the end of the century, about 9.4 centimeters for the low emission scenario, about 20 centimeters for the high emission scenario. And I want to emphasize this is not the ice sheets. This is really all the glaciers in the world outside the ice sheets. The ice sheets have to be added to that. Um, if you translate that into sea level rise rates, you see for the RCP 2.6, which is to the left, the rates will actually decrease. And that is because the, uh, the warming is as such that the glaciers actually can uh, reach a new equilibrium. They retreat to higher elevations and then don't lose that much mass anymore. This is, they, they can become healthy again. Um, for the 8.5, they can't do that that warming is so high that the sea level contribution and the mass loss increases with every year, essentially until the end of the century. How does it look regionally differentiated? This is now 19 regions in the world, including the global to the left, global without Antarctic and Greenland periphery glaciers. What you see is in every single region, substantial mass loss. The other thing you see it makes a, different which, a difference which scenario. RCP 2.6 or 8.5 is a difference in most regions. And the other thing you see, there's huge differences between regions. The regions that have a lot of ice, Alaska, Greenland, those lose relatively less mass than other regions. They lose between 10, 20, 30 percent by the end of the century. But the regions that have little ice right now, and like Scandinavia, North Asia, Central Europe, low latitudes, those for the high emission scenario, higher emission scenario, lose 80% or more of their volume by the end of the century. And that has not many, uh, the implications are not for sea level rise, but of course for, for local hydrology. So individual glaciers. So this is your simulation with a very um, sophisticated model until the end of the century, I mean huge changes. This looks very, very different to the landscape by the end of the century. And this is the largest glacier in, in Central Europe. Um, looking at a high emission scenario and low emission scenario, for in the beginning, it doesn't make much difference. The retreat is very, very similar. But towards the end, it looks very, very different. 
So glaciers will disappear. And this is something we see already. There's another glacier in Switzerland in 2006. This is how it looked in 2018. I mean, this is just a little bit more than 12, 10 years. And only looking from 2017 to 19 is a dramatic change. So 40% of the area just lost in one year. This is a simulation of a large ice field in, in Alaska. The area of the ice field is 50% more um, area of, uh, than the European Alp Alps have. So it's a huge ice field and also by the end of the century, massive changes, like volume area change of about 50-60%. But these glaciers are in relatively high mountains, so although there are large project, uh, projected losses, this ice field is le less susceptible to climate warming than other ice fields in Alaska because it can retreat to higher elevation. But Yakutat ice, uh, ice field is close by, very close, is 600 square kilometers, also a huge glacier, and it is doomed. Even under constant climate, there's no chance it can survive. It's disappearing within decades, a 600 square kilometer um, ice field. So it makes, it's not only the climate that de uh, determines the response of the glaciers, but also the physical setting. Like in higher mountains, the glaciers can retreat, whereas if the ice field is at low elevation, it has no chance. It's doomed. It's going to go. We ran for the Juno ice field. Um, different scenarios where we froze the climate at different years from the um, RCP projection. So if we take current climate, the ice field stabilized it at 86 degrees. And we ran this until year two, uh, 3,000 years. And depending where you do the split off experiment, where you start keeping the climate constant, you see a big difference. If you go until the end of the century and keep that constant, the ice field is gone. So the main message is here, emission scenarios matter. It makes a huge difference when you freeze the climate here. In freezing climate, I mean keep it constant after an hour um, increase of emissions. There's not many projections going beyond 2100. This is a study from 2012. There's no other study since. And it shows a little bit what Pam was discussing just before me, that until 2100, there's actually not too much difference. But once beyond that, you can see that under RCP 2.6, the glaciers are actually gaining mass again. It's a huge difference. Whereas under RCP 8.5, there's a massive mass loss. You see here the contribution to sea level rise, the annual one. And by the end of the century, it looks very similar, but for different reasons. Um, under a low emission scenario, there's not much water coming from the glacier on an annual basis just because they have retreated. They're healthy again. The healthy glacier has no contribution to sea level rise. It gains mass in winter, it loses in summer, and there's no net contribution. Whereas under RCP 8.5, there's no contribution because the glaciers are gone. So that's a very a different. We want, I mean, even though it looks the same, but what we want is the glaciers healthy somewhere in the mountains um, and not contributing to sea level rise instead of them being gone. And looking regionally differentiated, here this figure shows like mass losses when the curve goes up. And also here, Central Europe, if you look at the red curve, which is the RCP 2.6, the glaciers are gaining mass again, if you just continue that scenario. So again, main message, emission scenarios matter. So we can do something about it. So what are the impacts? Why does it matter? And one, I mean, I talked about sea level rise already. Stream flow is another one. One impact of the glaciers on stream flow is this concept of peak water, that the annual runoff, because the glaciers lose, have a net mass loss, the runoff will increase. But as the glacier retreats, and this storage is depleted, the runoff will decrease. And for water resources management, it's of course very important when that happens, um, because I mean, first there's an increase and then there's a decrease. If you want to build a power plant or water for irrigation and so on, this is very, very important. When do you have that turning point? So this is a figure from the SROC report. The bars show a modeling study 
every single glacier in the world was calculated when the peak water is. And then, of course, different glaciers react different in the same regions. That's why you have like um, it's each bar shows how much glacier area has reached peak water here in 10 year intervals. So and it's sorted by peak water. And the circles show some additional studies from the literature, everything that we can find that had peak water. And that nicely coincides. This is sorted by peak water. And what you see is in regions like the low latitudes, Central Europe, also Western Canada, I mean, many regions, many areas in these regions, peak water has already been reached. That means runoff goes down. Whereas in regions like here, Iceland, Southern Andes, Alaska, most of the area has not reached peak water yet. It will reach it at the end of the century. And this is a matter of how much ice there is. So the regions that have little ice have reached peak water already or will reach it very soon, whereas regions that have a lot of ice will re reach it at a later point. This is here a study that will be published next week um, about high mountain Asia looking at different catchments of all the water coming from the glaciers. And what you can see is in some regions, it's already going down. Peak water has been reached. And in these regions, it doesn't really matter which scenario you follow, which emission scenario. But in other regions, it really makes a difference which scenario you, you follow. And you see large increases in runoff, for instance, in the Tarim or in the inner, inner Tibetan plateau large increases before it then decreases. And this is, of course, very imp important for irrigation or for like, I mean, all the people that depend on that water. And the overall mass losses, what we calculated here is 33 to 68% in high mountain Asia. Um, this is a map of the peak water. Red is where it has already been reached under RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. And you see also here, there's sort of a consistent pattern of a lot of red in the southern area, and that's because peak water has already been reached, um, whereas in other regions, uh, peak water has not been reached. It's so within short distances, you see huge differences if it's reached like in 2020 or in 2080. So huge differences. Depends where you are, has a tremendous in impact then for those people who live there and depend on the water. And what we see is the monsoon fed rivers, like the Ganges and Brahmaputra, they reach peak water mostly before to, uh, the middle of the century, and the westerlies fed rivers reach it at, uh, later. So, peak water, it's important when it happens, but of course, if the increase is only a percent of two, who cares? So it also matters how much it is increasing. And that's enormous numbers. Um, here's the annual, the increase up to peak water. Not very much here in the south because peak water has already been reached. There's not much time to increase anymore. But in the areas where peak water is late, this increases of 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. So it does matter. There's a really lot more water coming from the glaciers, but highly differentiated where you are. So how is that? water distributed over the season. So there is more water or less water. Is it equally distributed? Because that is important for agriculture. When is it coming? So and what you see here is for every month, how the runoff will change by 2050, the first column, or 2100, the second. And blue is an increase in runoff, big circles, big increase. And red is a negative uh, decrease in runoff. And we see it's not distributed equally over the year. And that's very important for agriculture. So you see essentially a pattern around the world that there's an increase in June, a large increase in June in most catchments in the world. And this is large catchments. This is really macro scale river basins. Then in, in July and August, you see a lot more red. So there's a, a, a decrease. And that's often the period that is dry in some of the catchments. It's summer, it's dry, the glaciers are compensating. So that's where it matters. And in October, you see a mixed picture, but also a lot of blue again. So there's really a difference. If you're in July, increase almost everywhere. August, not much change. September, a decrease. And in October, here in high mountain Asia, you see increases and decreases. So does it matter? 
These rivers are huge, just the little glaciers like high up in the catchment matter. And this is a study that we did here with all catchments in the world, macro scale catch catchments. And we, we saw that there are catchments, large uh, uh, scale river basins where it does matter that in at least one month of the year, the runoff of these big rivers is decreased by 10, 20 or 30% because of the, um, the changing glaciers. And that is in particular in high mountain Asia. It's really a hot spot. And it's just sort of one month of the year. But that's why annual values do not necessarily matter. What matters for people is like how much is there in June when you, when you start uh, yeah, working with your crops. So impact on stream flow, we see changes in seasonality around the world, increase in winter runoff everywhere, earlier spring peaks, we see increases and decreases in summer and annual runoff, depending on the peak water. Is it just, uh, that makes it so complex. You have increases and decreases depending when, where you are. And it also affects the water quality and properties. For instance, if the glaciers melt, the stream flow um, is warmer. And in Alaska, this is important for salmon. I mean, fish has a very, very low tolerance for, for temperature. So it, it has an impact on fish populations. We also see a release of mercury and other legacy contaminants that are stored in glaciers now that the glaciers retreat. There's also other impacts. There's impacts of glacier retreat on slopes, slope instability. This is an example of a glacier that has thinned tremendously in Switzerland. And with uh, the glacier thinning, it's like all this debris falling off, like an increase, uh, increases in rockfall and landslides. We've seen increase and in the past and also project in the future of the number of glacier lakes and the size of these lakes. And that is, of course, very important for glacier outburst floods. So there's an increased risk for outburst floods in the future as the glaciers retreat and um, these lakes are formed or enlarged in size. And glacier lake outburst floods are the most devastating natural uh, disasters related to glaciers. Um, here in India, in Kedanath in 2013, 4,000 people died when this one lake um, was draining. Another impact is we have seen just a few years ago, in 2016, two glaciers collapsing. And this is a very rare event. Um, and it's not clear, I mean, how this relates to climate change, but it's conceivable that this become, will, may become more common because this has been modeled and it's also the increase in melt and water that gets to the base of the glacier and the glacier literally collapsed. So it looked like this. Nine people died. I mean, the glacier was essentially like, like a big avalanche coming, disintegrating, running down the valley and killing nine people and a lot of um, livestock as well. Another impact is changing landscapes. I showed these retreating glaciers in Switzerland. I mean, they don't look very pretty when they retreat. There's a lot of rocks that changes landscapes and the potential for tourism, which is one example here in Juneau. Uh, there's a visitor center here in Alaska. Um, 10,000 people live there. There's half a million visitors coming every year to see the Mendenhall Glacier. We projected the future of that glacier in 20 years. It's around the corner, and people won't see it anymore from the visitor center. So this might have direct um, economic impacts here um, on this small community. Um, it also impacts cultural values. Um, glaciers are among the principal reasons for five sites or secondary reasons for 28 sites for World Heritage Natural Sites. And just this year it came out that about half of the World Heritage Sites could lose their glaciers by 2100. So they're essentially compromising the reason why there are World Heritage Sites. And examples are around the world, in Argentina, Alaska, Greenland, Swiss Alps, Himalaya, like everywhere. They also impact cultural values. Um, in some communities, people are very attached to the glaciers. They're part of the belief system. Um, they have a certain spirituality connected with the glaciers here, a pilgrimage to a glacier in Peru, also in Bhutan, but also there are studies in the Italian Al Alps that people feel sort of distressed when the glaciers retreat, and in some communities they even feel like the, um, the, it's their fault, and that causes stress and indirectly affects our uh, well-being. So 
Another impact, and that's a positive one, of course now are artifacts that are hundreds or thousands of years are increasingly melting out, so a heaven for glacier archaeologists, um, and especially because they're so well preserved, everything that is in the ice. So not everything is negative, but yeah. So archaeologists have a good time here. Um, so I hope it became clear that there, we have glaciers are losing mass rapidly and will lose in the future. And this impacts people around the world through sea level, stream flow, hazards, landscapes, changes, and also cultural values. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, I think we have time for two questions. Regina, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. Um, I, I'm wondering, because you're reviewing previous literature, was there time in this to take into account uh, the darkening of some glacier surfaces by algae, which has been reported more recently, perhaps? Yes, that's, we looked at that. We, we assessed that literature. It's really, I mean, um, it is clear that locally, if you have uh, a darkening of the surface is also more absorbing, but how much really the impact is on a regional scale, I think that's still up in the air. I mean, the, that is emerging literature. Locally, yes, but how much it really matters for the world's glacier budget, I think that's not clear yet. Thank you. Hey, are there any more questions? All right, thank you, Regina. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, as we change out the laptops, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Heidi Stelzer from Fort Lewis College in Colorado. Uh, Dr. Stelzer was also a lead author on the recent IPCC SROC report. And she'll be talking to us about snow. didn't start where I wanted to. The fast way back through the whole presentation. So mountains have glaciers and they have snow. Frozen water exists in permafrost as well. We're going to focus on glaciers and snow today. So imagine you have two pockets. In one pocket, is your bank savings account. The money you've stored away from years and years and years of savings, and those are the mountain glaciers, representing in your pocket money or stored water, an available resource that the world has to supply um, water for human well-being. What's in the other pocket? The other pocket is the seasonal snowpack. It's the accumulation of water on an annual basis. It's how much money you're tucking away in a different pocket, only within the year, and you plan and expect to spend all that money and have that money uh, move out of your pocket. The thing that becomes really complex and decreases the resilience for mountain communities and for lowland communities is when we're spending money out of both pockets simultaneously and the pockets are getting smaller and we don't have as much money in our pockets. So we're losing resources of water supply from mountain systems, both in the long stored water supply that, that Regina talked about and in the short term water supply, which is snow. So why do cryosphere dynamics um, must they mean a 1.5C pathway? Because we can't afford to keep spending money that fast. We can't afford to keep moving money out of our bank accounts, both bank accounts at the same time. Where and how does water connect to health and well-being? The life in and beyond mountain regions depends on snow and ice. 
And to give you a sense of what that looks like, I hope this works. I've gotten onto the, the internet. This is a short video. And uh, for folks who haven't gone to a mountain region to see what it's like when the snow is melting, I think it's really um, worthwhile to come and see this. So give it a try. It's going to open up. It's going to work. This is the mountain valley that I study. It's the East River watershed. It's the upper. And the sound's not important. The sound should be me. Uh, sorry, the sound sounds kind of loud. I can't change or adjust the sound. The birds are fake. There we go. OK, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I really do want to take you to the mountains with me, though. How do I make this not full screen? Okay. Oh. Okay. Here we are. We're all set up. Upper headwaters to the Colorado River. This is a part of Colorado that supplies water for Los Angeles, Phoenix, parts of Mexico, El Paso, and out to vast regions. The water doesn't all melt at once. The snow doesn't all melt at once. The water doesn't move into the rivers all at once. It moves and melts over time differently across elevation. So one of the patterns that SROC reports on is that we're seeing changes. Oh, we, the life of a snowball is actually absolutely worth seeing. <laughs> My kids and I got really creative. <laughs> OK, we're back to this. Um, so the snow line's moving up in elevation. And the melt is happening faster across all elevations. And so where, where Regina showed when and how is the seasonality of water supply affected, it's affected both by the patterns of how the warming is affecting the, the glacier water and by how the water is affecting the snow, the snow. So we have two ways that we may have more water early in the season and less water late in the season when water supply is most needed for agriculture. How much of the world's Earth's surface is part of a snow-dominated watershed. It's pretty incredible to see that. It's far beyond what many of us would expect. This is a map that shows it. It's from a review paper that was published back in 2005. All of the area that's blue are parts of the Earth's surface where more than 50% of the runoff and the water moving into the watershed and into the water system is coming from melting snow. Some of those areas are very dark blue. Those are areas where 70, 80, and 90% of the water is coming from snow. And as we change those systems so that they're no longer as snow dominated, we're changing the natural storage system that occurs on an annual basis that tucks water away in winter so that water can be available in summer during the growing season and during seasons when we may need that water for energy and other aspects of human life. So this is a summary of three aspects of the SROC report on changing snow. SROC is the special report on the oceans and the cryosphere and a changing climate. It's the report that was just released in September of this year by the IPCC. The presence and the persistence of ice and snow are changing in the world's mountains. We weren't sure that this would be the story that came out. Regina highlighted that across mountain regions, ice is changing in many places and in more similar ways than we might expect. That's similar to the pattern that we were trying to understand for snow. Mountain regions are far from coasts and close to coasts. Mountain regions are low elevation. Mountain regions are very, very high elevation. Mountain regions are small and narrow or really wide and vast, like the, the, the Tibetan Plateau. Is there a common story across 
all of those very varied mountain regions about how snow is changing, and this is what emerged as we did the analyses. The presence of snow, that's a really significant thing. We're talking about a location that has had snow, has had snow for centuries, and we may no longer see snow. We have, we're already starting to not, no longer see snow in those places. And a change from a, a system that has some snow to has no snow is a really different change. Snow protects the earth. It sustains the growth of vegetation um, in ways that water just, uh, rainwater just can't keep up. Um, it insulates the ground. Um, it changes the culture of a region to have or not have snow. So there's many ways that, that change in presence is important. The persistence of snow gets at the idea of just how much of the year is snow around for. So in regions like Europe and the US, regions where there is winter snowpack, so snow that comes, arrives, these are both northern latitudes, so the snow is starting to build in October, and the snow is lasting until April or May. In regions that have persistent snowpack that lasts all winter, snow arrives later, it melts earlier, and it covers less ground. So those all relate to those same ideas that I just said in the persistence and presence of snow. Those are aspects of snowpack that we can characterize through remote sensing. You can picture in your mind what it looks like when a landscape becomes snow covered, and when it loses its snow. There are many other ways that snow is changing. Um, snow dynamics are complex, for which we can't use satellite remote sensing to detect and characterize the changes. There has to be physical monitoring of people going out into the system and doing snow pits, digging holes into snow, um, and characterizing aspects of the snowpack. Things like snow water equivalent, how much water is in the snow, we can best know by going and digging a snow pit at a site. Snow is changing in many other ways that we only monitor in few locations when you consider the vast extent of the world's mountain regions. And so we have to make some inferences that where we see the patterns from satellites, the same patterns um, of snow water availability are changing even though we don't have data. Not all the regions of the world's mountains have snow cover like Europe and the US. Those are two of the best, most well-studied um, regions of the world. In the mountains of, of China and across the Tibetan Plateau, snowpack doesn't come and stay all winter. Over vast regions of the Tibetan Plateau, snow comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. It comes and it stays for a little longer, and then it goes. And so what I'm talking about is within a year, starting somewhere in, this is a snowfall event this September on the Tibetan Plateau in China, that snow came and it was gone within a day. Similarly, there will be multiple other snow events like that, and then maybe sometime in February the snow will come and there will be 20 centimeters and it will stay around for two weeks and then it will melt out. When snowpack is uh, not accumulating all winter, we still need to develop more ways to talk about, think about, frame, and tell the story of how changing snow matters for these systems. One of the things that is being studied and seen in the mountains of China that stood out as I did review of uh, changes in ecosystems across the world's mountains is that um, plants are greening on the Tibetan Plateau in winter time, in months where it would have maybe been snow covered, maybe not, but it would have at least been cold enough for those plants to not be greening up. Where and what difference does that make? We need to figure that out. Mountain plants are pretty tough, but when a plant uses resources to grow for a little part of the winter, and then it's going to be cold or snow covered again, we don't know whether it's using too much of the resources it needs for summer before um, we get to summer. The other thing that's really important and stood out as part of the SROC report for changes in mountain systems on the Tibetan Plateau is that they're underlain by permafrost. So our cryosphere stories intersect with one another. There is not much mountain permafrost relative to the Tibetan Plateau in any of the other mountain ranges of the world. 
So when we look at the stories emerging from how this region of, of mountains is changing, it has an available water supply. So that's one story. The water from the melting permafrost can provide for sustaining plant growth in dry times when there isn't enough coming in from snow. So the mountains get greener, but it's a result of using some of the money that was stored in a savings account in the form of permafrost. The other piece that is um, an important characteristic of this region is that with that permafrost, there's vast amounts of stored carbon. And what we know about permafrost in the Arctic, we know only a fraction about for characterizing permafrost and carbon emissions from mountain regions. It's much less well studied. Moving on to a third region. So I'll cover three regions as part of this. The persistence of snow in the southern Andes. So this is Chile um, and Argentina regions of the mountains of the world. In these regions, the snow story is the same. The snow story of decreasing snow cover, earlier snow, later snowfall, earlier snow melt is happening. Some of those data are there primarily because of satellite remote sensing. What I could not find, and three, four, five of us spent time looking for articles, was articles that connected how do those changing, does that changing snowpack matter for the plants, the ecosystems, the health of the animals, um, and where and how do we make that inner connection between a physical change in an earth system and the biological and social system changes. Maybe we missed a study and the studies are reported in Spanish and we didn't, weren't able to find them, but it's also possible there are just very few studies that are doing this because in some parts of the world, the investment can't be as much as in some of the more developed parts of the world, and yet we need to know about all the parts of the world. So that brings me to my next point, mountain futures. There's many possible places and ways that the mountains could look in the future. What would we most like to know? We would like to know more about many places, not just a few. I'm gonna put up a fairly complex graph, map, figure of the world. It's high mountain regions of the world. It's part of the chapter two high mountains and similar maps have been made for some of the other regions. When you look at this, look at the blank boxes. I'm telling you to look at the part of the map that we're, we may less likely put our attention to. So these are global high mountain regions, high mountain rugged terrain and high enough elevation. They're regions that have snow and glaciers. Across all those regions, the first column of squares is physical changes. The second column of squares is ecosystem changes. The third column of changes is social system changes and ecosystem services that are impacted. Everywhere you see a blank box is a location that we do not have peer-reviewed scientific studies to understand how changes in the cryosphere impact are happening or impact ecosystems and human well-being. What do we want to know about the future if we're missing data on the changes that have happened to date? That's a lot of blank boxes and, and where and how to communicate the importance of those blank boxes is that doesn't mean nothing's happening. That means we do not know what's happening based on peer-reviewed journal articles and scientific studies. Many of those blank boxes are in parts of the world where people live. So there are people there who can tell us the stories, the stories of their lives, the stories of generations in their communities. So building the space where we integrate the human stories, the traditional knowledge of these regions, can fill blank boxes so that our map doesn't look so empty and we have more information about what has happened and what could happen in the future. And with that, we very much want to aspire for 1.5C. So a big part of the Cryosphere 1.5C report that released today, published by the um, International Climate Cryosphere Initiative, is that we want to aim for 1.5C as a commitment to reliable water and the well-being of people and planet. These two things are intertwined. 
climate change, people's health and well-being, people's health and their rights to well-being. Another report released recently, the Future Earth Report, 10 New Insights in Climate Science in 2019. The world is not on track. Climate change is faster and stronger than expected. Those both are paralleled in the, in the world's mountains. And with that, climate change leaves no mountain summit behind. We're seeing changes in all of the mountain regions that have negative consequences for human health and well-being across the globe. What are the changes? You heard from Regina that glaciers are losing mass. Water availability is negatively affected by changing snow and ice. Hot spots of mountain biodiversity are smaller, so we're losing the area where plants and species can tuck themselves away on a hotter, warmer planet. And adaptation is possible but more difficult if, human, if high emissions continue. Snow provides water and we hope for snow. Hope is a powerful sentiment and we want to have hope. What does hope for water look like? Hope for water in the Colorado Rockies in the lowest snow year um, in decades. That's what this graph shows. So this is all of the gray is the typical snowpack in the region that I live in, in the state that I live in in the US. That red line purposefully ending, this is 2018, Purposefully ending right there in March is how much snow we had in March. And you can see we're about to step out of that gray zone. We're about to dip into a record low snowpack year. And in a record low snowpack year, in a rural mountain region, the ranchers talk snow, the ski resort and the skiers talk snow, the folks that manage schools and plan for schools talk snow, the agriculturalists talk snow, everybody's talking snow. And everybody is talking, don't worry, we'll get snow. It often snows a lot in March. And if we look at those graphs and the data, it does often snow a lot in March. So we hoped for snow in March, and we didn't get snow. We hoped for snow in April, and we didn't get snow. It almost never snows a lot in May, but we were all talking that it would snow in May. Maybe this would be the year that a lot of snow came in May. So we put ourselves into that space of hoping for the water resource we know our region and our community depends on. And it doesn't necessarily make it happen. But we do have decisions that we can make to adapt to not having a lot of snow or to minimize the chances that we have such um, incredibly low snow years, potentially record low snow years that are lower than any other year in the past. Snow does more than provide water. It provides the moisture that land needs to minimize the consequences of fire. So in 2018, in the community that I live in, we all knew there was a huge chance for a wildfire. Everything was dry, and because of past forage forest management, we have really high fuel loads. A spark, that just takes people. It doesn't necessarily take people. It can also be lightning. But a lot of fires are human started, and they're not intentional. So this was not an intentional spark. It was a human-caused spark to this fire, and it burned 55,000 acres of a mountain watershed. When I began to work on S Rock, I wanted to see if this story um, was also something we're seeing in other mountain regions a lack of snow, and because of a lack of snow, a presence of wildfire. So far, the only published peer-reviewed study that shows that connection is for uh, the Western US. It's a more dry region with a different land use history than a lot of parts of mountain regions around the world, and so we're seeing a pattern in that zone, but that doesn't mean the pattern might not soon happen in other zones. The other two places that I thought we would most likely see that story is the um, Australian Alps, and certainly there have been a lot of fires in Australia this year um, in lower land regions. And I thought we might see that story in the southern part of Europe, so in the region that we're in. Um, the story here, the peer-reviewed studies, said that there are droughts that are leading to consequences for wildfire, but it didn't call out snow as a factor. And so we have to balance that we don't have the evidence yet for, for, for that connection. 
One of our choices is to manage for other stresses. So this is from part C of the SROC SPM. This is um, where and how do we plan for choices that we want to see mitigation at the global level in a decrease in fossil fuel use. But if that isn't happening, how can communities and regions start to plan for protecting and adapting by reducing other stresses? For my region and for many mountain regions, it's through protecting the adjacent deserts and the desert lands to ensure that we don't have dust on snow events. Dust on snow means that if you have less snow cover and more rapid snow melt because of the, the warming planet, you also have more rapid melt because of the change in the surface reflectance and dark snow absorbing a lot more sunlight and energy and melting even faster. So caring for the lands adjacent to mountains is one way that we can protect the mountains. With that, I have one last thing. Do I still have time or are we done? Just, okay. I'm trained as a biologist. I put the biology in the context of where and how mountain systems function. The plants in mountains have taught me many lessons. This is the plant that I did my PhD on. It's an alpine plant that is beyond crazy stress tolerant. It has incredible opportunities to store resources and in storing resources and restricting growth, survive incredibly cold, windy, poor soils. This plant is growing almost directly on tops of rocks. And so I want to tell you a quick story that ties that idea of mountain plants into where and how we're having impacts on people. So I know that when a mountain plant, one that evolved for cold has little water, it does not grow. It saves its resources. It shows restraint. The plant survives, but I don't know for how many years of dry times it can survive. As we rapidly change the temperature, the snow, and the ice, we are experimenting globally, not just with plants, but also with people. Not many people are choosing to make this choice and continue the experiment. We have sufficient data. We know that there will be greater harm as we go from 1 degree C to 1.5 degree C to 2 degree C or even higher than that. It's time that we start to challenge the expectation that science will provide enough evidence to support stronger commitments to climate change and recognize that leaders don't ask for showing harm. They protect people and their well-being. We have the opportunity now to do that, to say that we're going to be putting people, ecosystems, and planet first rather than waiting to see just how long people can survive not doing well as mountain plants can. Thanks so much, and I'll take questions. All right, I think we have time for one or two questions. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, did your report go very much into the, uh, uh, the changes in uh, plants uh, associated with climate and their interaction with snow, particularly in the Alpine, where there's some very interesting interactions, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> it was interesting. So that's exactly what I study. And there's many reasons why it's hard to figure out how to get the research that you know best into a report, including that the job isn't to promote myself in any way. And, and what I know best is to try and have balanced coverage. So one of the things that we're seeing and was in the report is that for many mountain regions, plants are growing more. There is greater productivity, but that doesn't necessarily, that's a little bit like the glacier story for how long can they continue to be more productive and greener. One of the things that we want, and we can see that through, um, through greenness indices. One of the other things we want to know is do the plants have more water in them and are they moving more water? And that's the research we do, uh, that I do, and that I'm involved in with the US Department of Energy. And we don't yet, we can't yet tell that story. To what extent, when plants grow more in mountain environments, are they moving more water to the sky and decreasing how much water goes down to the ground to recharge aquifers? Um, so we're working on that, and we hope to, 
I spent a lot of time in an IPCC report and I stopped trying to publish papers. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Thank you all, right, all for you. being here and joining us at the Cryosphere Pavilion. Um, up next, we have Dr. Dirk Knotts, I think, running over from an IPCC meeting to speak about sea ice. Um, and then at 4 p.m., we're going to have Dr. Gustav Hugelius tuning, um, joining us over Zoom to speak about permafrost. Um, and then lastly, 5 p.m., I'll be wrapping up talking about the ice sheets. Thank you.